Is it time? It is time for us to do what we have been doing, and that time is every day. We'll know in a very short period of time, but it looks like it could be something that will be uh, not good. Believe me, not good. Um, so, uh, you know, I see issue with yeah, that. And okay, again, you're, hey, 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 hey. Uh, you're not going to be able to insult your way to the presidency. That's not going to happen. I don't know who created Pokemon Go. Go. But I'm trying to figure out how we get them to have Pokemon go to the polls. I'm Ted Cruz, and my pronoun is kiss my ass. So when you think about it, there is great significance to the passage of time in terms of what we need to do to lay these wires, hey, 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 hey. what we need to do <laughs> to create these we jobs. Will not get 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 America is a nation that can be defined in a single word. I was going to put him in uh, foot, foot. Uh, Not good. Believe me, not good. What's up, everybody? Welcome, Dissidents, one and all, to a Wednesday evening edition of the Do Dissidents podcast. My name is Keaton Weiss, here, of course, with Russell Dobular. Hello. We have a great show in store for you guys tonight. I do want to apologize to those who were intending to watch this on Rumble. Uh, the Rumble stream never got going correctly. I double checked to see if it was something on my end. It is not. So once again, our lifeboat uh, has another hole in it. Um, but I did post the YouTube link in the Rumble chat. So if you were on Rumble expecting a show, uh, you should have seen that chat message and come over here uh, to YouTube where we are on. And we have a very, very special guest uh, for you guys this evening. Uh, Shama Sawant is here from Worker Strike Back. I just want to make a couple of announcements before we start the interview. Shama was kind enough to accept questions from the chat. And so if you would like to ask a question for Shama, we will be taking questions after the interview of Shama Sawant is not for sale. We all know that about Shama, but we all know about us that we are for sale. And so the best way to get your questions read is to put a buck or two on it, make it a super chat. However, our producer Jake is here and he will be fishing out some non-super chat questions. So this is not a completely pay to play operation tonight, but just so you guys know, we will be taking questions after the this interview is, portion. There's like a sliding scale interview. <laughs> sliding tonight. scale, right, exactly. And, <laughs> exactly. Uh, be, be, be generous peter thiel heard we had shaman he cut us off from right Rumble. he cut our stream that's Those the thing tech billionaires don't like that exactly exactly i'm convinced this is the first time we've ever not had a stream start on rumble before um it's but ai man it's saw shama boom yeah boom yeah that's it that's it could be could be but like i said folks uh, Shama is kind enough to be taking questions, so get those questions in during the interview. We'll take them after. Jake is in the booth, so a round of applause for Jake. He'll be picking out some questions uh, as well. We thank you all for being here. Shama Sawant, obviously Seattle City Council member and um, an organizer for Workers Strike Back, an organization that she chose to found after uh, she departs from the Seattle City Council this December. I mean, the organization is on its feet now, but um, the impetus for her leaving the City Council was to focus on a national labor-oriented movement called Workers Strike Back. She also has another project, which was just formally, officially, I mean, I've known about this for a while, a lot of us have, but it was formally, officially announced today that she'll be starting a podcast and YouTube show called On Strike. So before we admit Shama, we're going to take a look at the trailer for her new program, which just dropped today. A mess. Working people. The world is a mess. Working people face a deep cost of living crisis, war, social upheaval, right wing attacks on oppressed groups, and the onward march of climate catastrophe. We have been sold out repeatedly by those who claim to stand with us, whether so called progressive Democrats or Republican politicians posing as workers' representatives. Working people are starting to fight back, and already 322,000 have gone on strike this year. But we urgently need to get organized and we need our own independent fighting organizations. 
That is why Socialist Alternative and I have launched Worker Strike Back. I'm Shama Sawad. And I'm Bia Lacombe. Working people desperately need our own media as well. The corporate press represents the views and interests of wealthy elites, not workers. When they cover a strike or a protest, if they do at all, it's to undermine or demonize it, to take the side of the bosses, not workers or young people. At the same time, mainstream progressive media provides cover for the betrayals of Democratic politicians like Biden and the squad, such as when they broke the strike of railroad workers last year. Our aim is to use this show to help build working class struggle in our workplaces and on the streets. We unambiguously stand with working people against the billionaires and their political servants. To make real gains, like a $25 an hour minimum wage or Medicare for all, we have to build powerful movements as we have done again and again with my socialist city council office in Seattle. We need concrete fighting strategies that can point a way forward to win. All right, everybody. And with that, it is a great pleasure and a great honor to introduce our guest for the evening, Shama Sawant. Shama, thank you so much for being here. It's great to see you. Thank you so much for having me. And sorry about the rumble thing. I know. Uh, just it's we very strange. It happened. Very, very, very suspicious. Very Has this suspicious. happened to you before? <laughs> Is Not that exactly, with you? but I wouldn't be surprised either. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. They call it a free speech platform. And as soon as we have Shama Sawant on, oops, uh, error. Yeah, that's it. First time uh, that ever happens. <laughs> first time that ever happened. Who very should we suspicious. have on next week? We'll have uh, Steven Crowder or maybe Alex Jones or somebody like that, and it'll be working. It'll, it'll work fine. Uh, that, that's, that's what I suspect. I'm going to call it that. Um, but Shama, we have a lot to get to tonight. And so thank you so much for making the time for us. So I just want to get us started. Most of us, uh, here, um, are familiar with worker strike back, but can you tell us more about it for those who might not know much about it yet and why you decided to leave the Seattle city council to form it? Yes. Yeah, so for those who might not know much about it, I am a member of uh, an organization called Socialist Alternative, which is a nationwide organization. And we together as an organization launched a campaign for city council in 2013. We won that campaign against all odds. Uh, and we proved that there is a huge opening for genuine working class politics, not like pretend progressive politics that we see most of the time and then in the nearly 10 years that we've been in office we have won victories that were thought of as unwinnable we made seattle the first major city to win the 15 dollar an hour minimum wage we won the amazon tax which is a nearly 300 million dollar uh, annually a tax to uh, you know taxing with the wealthiest individuals to fund affordable housing green new deal programs that was, uh, as you might imagine, a major fight against Jeff Bezos himself and the C Amazon Corporation, which is headquartered here, and a whole host of unprecedented renters' rights victories. We also won the world's uh, the only ban on caste-based discrimination outside South Asia, which you know galvanized South Asian American activists. So we've 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 shown that uh, a socialist fighting approach can win victories for the working class, unite working people across race, across gender, across nationality, and really that this is the way to fight against oppression as well. And this is such a contrast, not only to the so-called progressive Democrats that we have on offer, whether it's in Seattle or the squad in Congress, and also to what I would call a whole, unfortunate, a whole layer of misleaders that came from the BLM movement, from the Democratic Party aligned women's organizations who failed to win uh, in the codifying of Roe v. Wade. So, you know, whether you're talking about the bread and butter issues for working people or for those same working people, the fight against oppression, we can see that this is the approach that works. And so we don't want it to be limited just to Seattle. It is unfortunate that it's one of the only or maybe the only the rare uh, example of this kind of fighting strategy. And so we want to take this nationally and ultimately, you know, at this moment, the most important 
component of fight back is inside the labor movement, in the union movement. And that's why Socialist Alternative and I have launched Workers Strike Back to take this same approach uh, in, in to build a militant rank and file. Indeed. So Worker Strike Back has gotten involved in these UPS contract uh, negotiations, urging the rank and file to vote no on the tentative agreement, which is currently being voted on as we speak. Um, can you explain why you're organizing for a no vote and what gains you hope to see won in the final contract? So just the con context behind this, and you guys have talked about this on your show before, which is that the 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 Sean O'Brien leadership in the Teamsters itself, the, the, their election itself represents a rank and file fight back uh, that, is, that goes back many, many years. The sellout by the much more entrenched business unionist leadership from James Hoffa Jr., who obviously, you know, was his, his main preoccupation was uh, building a relationship with the bosses. And so uh the fight back against business unionism has been going on from the rank and file and is something that we all in the working class should be proud of and so in that context the the tentative agreement does put forward some gains for the workers first of all it gets rid of the really justly hated so-called 22-4 classification which basically implies that uh you know it basically created a low lower tier of package car drivers uh, under the 2018 contract, and it's just you know workers are outraged about it. Um, basically, it's like you know it's like losing all your uh, uh, um, uh, all your rights as a worker and just working with no protections every day for longer hours, lower pay, uh, less contract protection than other drivers. It's basically a nightmare. So that's a, a good thing. It also uh, does bring forward wage increases, especially for part-time workers. But if you look at the numbers, unfortunately. I think it is clear, as many more and more workers now are saying, that Teamsters are saying that it's actually nowhere close to good enough. I mean, just look at the numbers. You know, right now, of course, the part-time workers are making really bad wages. I mean, poverty wages, fifteen dollars and something, and so this would the new contract would take them to twenty-one dollars an hour. But it is, first of all, not the twenty-five dollar minimum that many have been demanding. And then, in addition, if you look at the breakup over the lifetime of the contract the uh, for example the catch up raises for the workers with uh, you know senior workers would amount to about 50 cents for 5 years of work and then the raises would be capped at a dollar and 50 cents after 15 years of service and so if you look at all these numbers the gains that are available especially for part time drivers are nowhere good enough and i and i think the other like fun, more fundamental component that we should draw out, you know, in addition to the numbers themselves, is that a big goal, in my view, as a rank and file member of the labor movement myself, and as a fighter for the working class, I think there is a huge opportunity here, first of all, to really um, uh, build a fight back against the divide and conquer the UPS bosses have so successfully, unfortunately, done over right. the last year, the divide between drivers and inside workers mm -hmm. and the divide between full time workers and part time workers. Uh, and so uh, there is a huge momentum here, mo um, a real moment also here to build a, a fight for a much better contract. And, and the way to do that would be to build a vote no campaign, get the workers prepared for a short but really punchy, powerful strike action. And again, here we have to step back and look at the big picture here. We're not talking about just any corporation. This is UPS, right? UPS, which uh, is um, which accounts for 6% of the nation's GDP and 3% roughly of the global GDP. This is a serious choke point for US and global capitalism. If the workers at UPS were able to go on strike, this would bring help bring the U.S. economy nothing short of a grinding halt. And so the uh, social power that these workers possess is tremendous. So, so, you know, so part of this is also looking at this as how do we build a militant labor movement? We cannot let go of opportunities that are so strategically placed to make gains because obviously such a successful strike action will not only help win UPS workers a powerful contract, but on top of that, it would uh, help set the stage for the rest of the US and also global labor movement actually. So what what could the potential that is there to win 
I think should be brought to the fore. Uh, just to be clear, I don't think at this moment the vote no campaign is the majority. It is the yes campaign, unfortunately. But it is still important uh, for several reasons. I just want to quickly go over them to build the vote no campaign because uh, the more workers that we talk to, the more we are understanding that there is an opening. So, you know, this conversation, first of all, is very important. And uh, the voting, the last day for voting is uh, the 22nd, and most workers haven't voted yet. Most members haven't voted yet. So there is an opening for that. And then beyond everything, even if people said, well, the vote no won't succeed, still it is crucial because unless we have this kind of extremely important debate inside the labor movement, we are never going to make gains. Yeah, I just had a brief follow up to that because I worked as an inside worker at UPS for a holiday season. It was the 2020 pandemic holiday season. And I would have joined the union if they didn't start giving me the runaround about the books being closed a month into my tenure. So I ended up leaving because it didn't look like I was going to get to join. But anyway, I definitely picked up on a division between the inside workers and the drivers. And one of the things that I was concerned about going into this whole fight is that those divisions would be would sort of begin to show themselves in the negotiations and that video that we put out announcing that you were urging people to vote no which i believe you saw that got a lot of comments on youtube from drivers and inside workers and i started seeing those divisions kind of play out and I'm like oh that's a drag that's what i was afraid of um have you noticed any of that are the drivers and the full-timers more inclined to vote yes are the part-timers more inclined inclined to vote no is there division in the ranks that you can see from where you're at i think there is a real discussion among the workers and uh, we we are, I think it's fair to say that uh, many part-timers are the ones who are inclined to vote no because clearly they are at a losing end at, uh, in this tentative agreement compared to full-time workers. But there are also full-time workers uh, who are willing to vote no, maybe for their own reasons, maybe in solidarity with part-timers. But I, what I would say is that uh, as uh, if, if we are to build the labor movement and if we are to take the history of the labor movement seriously, then what it tells us is that your starting point uh, is inevitably going to be influenced by the, uh, the logic of capitalism itself. You know, so the bosses divide us. And so if we let them divide us, we'll be divided. You know, so it's not surprising if the starting point of the workers is to feel uh, intimidated about a strike action because you know let's be fair it this we're not going to be uh, we're not going to be a cavalier about calling for a strike action it is serious business the strike actions have to be well prepared there because you know you're not getting a paycheck during that period so we're not taking this lightly but at the same time we have seen again and again there's huge potential to build unity solidarity among the workers and uh the, and really prepare for such actions, but those things don't uh, happen automatically. And so really here, I would put the spotlight on the leadership of the labor movement as a whole here, because unless we really push to make that happen, then uh, we, we are going to see divisions among the workers. And then we, and then, you know what, unfortunately, what I've seen many labor leaders do is then turn around and blame the rank and file themselves, you know, for right. themselves, right. union, uh, union, uh, much of the union leadership itself holding members back, rejecting them being activated, you know, not really bringing them into discussions and debates and, you know, really bringing them forward and then saying, oh, well, look, workers themselves are divided. They, you know, the full time workers are not willing to f fight for the part time drivers. I don't accept that. I think that there is huge potential to build this. Look at how well the practice pickets went, you know. In the practice pickets itself, we saw a glimpse of what is possible. And so, First and foremost, I would really urge the leadership immediately, I mean, the time is not lost yet, to organize local, regional, and uh, national debate and discussion among the members. Let them all come together and discuss. I, I don't see how it doesn't help to actually build that kind of, uh, you know, bringing together of the workers that I, I think there's a potential for that. All right, I have one more question for you, and then I'll toss to Russell for a couple. So one of the other uh, causes you've been involved with recently, because you are still on the Seattle City Council, uh, you proposed a bill to limit rent increases uh, to no more than the inflation rate citywide, no exceptions uh, in Seattle. That measure failed 
six to two, uh, despite, as you claimed uh, in a recent press conference, uh, majority support amongst the city's residents. So um, can you explain sort of why and how that failed and, you know, what next steps are for renters? Yeah, as, as most people are experiencing around the nation, Seattle is in the throes of a housing affordability crisis, has been for several years. In between 2010 and 2020, the rents in Seattle almost doubled. I mean, it's it's a nightmarish situation for most people. And if you're not uh, already homeless or facing the prospect of homelessness, even then, most renters are living in a difficult situation. As I've said before, many young people I know are actually uh, living in, you know, living with housemates because they can't afford to live, have their own, uh, have their own, you know, home. And so, uh, in this context, rent control, as we propose, which is a limit on rent increases to the annual rate of inflation, and applying to every rental home, regardless of type, size, or building date, is exactly part of the shift we need. We also need a massive expansion of affordable housing, much more so than we have one to the Amazon tax. But we also need rent control because really what we're seeing is, um, you know, overall, we've seen the term greedflation come to the fore because uh, even even Wall Street analysts themselves are recognizing that actually so much of this inflation, this cost of living crisis has been fueled by the billionaire class doing increasing prices simply because they can. Uh, and so, you know, that's why saying greedflation. But on top of that, I think it's the worst. Some of the worst situation is in the housing market where you have big corporations owning much of the rental market nationally and in, and in Seattle. And those big corporations in turn being owned by really nefarious entities like BlackRock, Vanguard, you know, these types of uh, really shady elements. And so... Uh, ultimately, when the Democrats vote against some th some a sensible measure like rent control and urgently needed legislation like rent control, then ultimately what they're doing, no matter what they say, they're serving the billionaires of BlackRock and Vanguard. And this was this, and they did this despite, as you said, Keaton, there's majority support. In fact, Washington State, there's a poll statewide that shows that 71% of the state's likely voters support rent control. And you know, keep in mind this includes all the so-called conservative right, the uh, rural, counties in right. East. Yeah, exactly. Rural Washington, Eastern Washington. And in keep in mind, those counties uh, actually voted in stronger numbers for Bernie than in Seattle and King County. Right. And so this shows you that the working class is, you know, there's a there's a burning anger. And again, this also shows a potential for uniting people who are pot who who could be led into the hands of the right populist agenda. They could be won over on a working class agenda, but that's not happening. And, and as far as next steps are concerned, it really shows the need to build organizations like Workers Strike Back because it's the need for political organizations like that which outlast any election cycle or go beyond any one elected office or any one individual. That's what we need. And ultimately, Workers Strike Back you know, is calling for a new party for the working class because without that, really, a lot of this is a non-starter. All righty. Excellent. Well, I'll toss to Russell in just a moment. Folks, please hit that like button. Let's get an audience in here. Epic evening of independent media programming tonight. We had Jimmy interview Marianne Williamson. We got Shama here and then Nick Cruz versus Pasta at 9 o'clock. This is like... This is what a what a lineup. So thanks for being here. Are Hit that you like ready button. To rumble? <laughs> yeah, exactly. A lot of marquee TV here tonight. So please hit that like button if you can help us out. Thanks for being here. Russell, go ahead. Uh, I was fortunate enough to visit your native land in February. Um, and something that I noticed very quickly. But where, where, did, where did you go, by the way? Um, I did a tour of Rajasthan, so I was in uh, Jaisalmer, which was my favorite. The fort there out in the desert just blew my mind. Um, Varanasi, uh, Abhinari, uh, Agra, obviously Jaipur, Jodhpur, just that whole region. And, wow. uh, and, that, and then I went to Goa at the end, uh, which is a little closer to where you're, where you're from. Um, I noticed very quickly, I had no idea the subtleties and intricacies of Indian culture, that there was a whole vocabulary going on around me and the clothes were indicating things about religion and class and caste that were just invisible to me, unless, unless you speak that. And it occurred to me that 
you know, being from Flushing, Queens, I've been surrounded by South Asian immigrants my entire life. And I realized, you know, it's probably the same here. And that's what I thought of. You mentioned it before. You spearheaded the passage of the very first anti-caste discrimination law in the United States. And it made me it made me think of that. Well, has that been going on around me my entire life? And it was just invisible to me because I'm not from that culture. How common is that? How how prevalent is that in the Indian immigrant community? It's it's prevalent in fact probably the correct term is entrenched as you said it's 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 uh, it's everywhere around you in india but it's it's the same here obviously in india we see caste discrimination and caste oppression playing out uh, often in very brutal and violent ways you know rapes lynchings that sort of thing uh, in the united states not surprisingly, you don't see that, but you what you do see is caste discrimination that is quite pervasive and has become much more of an issue now that the South Asian population or South Asian origin population is of a sizable nature here. And anecdotally, I could give you any number of examples, but now we also have statistical studies that show that caste discrimination is very much an issue. And you're right, Russell, as you said, it's not something that somebody outside a South Asian, uh, you know, somebody who grew, did not grow up in a South Asian environment would catch on to because uh, it's not like racism where you, you, you can see the difference in the race between the person who is instigating the racism and the person who's experiencing it. Uh, in, in the case of caste discrimination, they both could look like the same, right. you know, same whatever ethnicity. And and so, yeah, it, it's, it's not often clear how it plays out. And that's why it was important that we we really built for this and we were able to win. And it really, the victory, honestly, just went viral precisely because such a victory has not been won in many decades. And we got email from people in India, activists in India who are looking to this as uh, not, not only about how to win this particular kind of thing, but more so more broadly and, and more importantly, how does this offer lessons for the fight back against the right wing, the Hindu right wing in India, and also in the US, really, because you know some of the similar lessons are, apply. Um, and, and building on that, I, I saw somebody was asking you about um, the fact that you have two South Asians running for president, but they're both in the GOP. You have Vivek <laughs> Ramaswamy, yeah. you have uh, Nikki Haley. Nikki Haley. Um, and we also know Matt Taibbi did a great series of articles about um, what happened with the Glenn Youngkin election in Virginia and how South Asian immigrants were a huge part of why he won, them swinging to the GOP. Um, why do you feel the GOP is making so many inroads into that community? Yeah, you know, it, it is like any other community, really. There, I don't think there's anything unique about the community. But what is happening here and what, what it reveals, I'm so glad you brought this up, is that uh, this is exactly why identity politics is a dead end. If we looked at this purely from a South Asian lens, then it would be completely confusing and, and just... Uh, uh, impossible to understand. How is it that you can have Vivek Ramaswamy and me? I mean, I have nothing in common with this guy. I mean, uh, uh, horrendous, odious, reactionary politics. And so the only way we can make sense of this is if we think of this from the standpoint of how uh, different political viewpoints play out under the system of capitalism. And unless you take class interest and class allegiance into account, you cannot really explain this. Um, and in fact, um, uh, one of the reasons why the G the Republican Party and, and, the, and the more conservative wing of the Democrats have, have been making gains with a section of the South Asian population is precisely because, uh, you know, roughly speaking, um, the people who are aligned with the reactionary politics mm -hmm. are much more well off economically. And I don't want to right. be simplistic, but that's just a fact. You know, it's, it's a fact. And it's actually the opposite of the way the Democratic Party shills in the corporate media, you know, they portray Trump supporters as just these uh, uneducated working class people, you know, the 
just demonizing the South as a whole, uh, just sort of saying, uh, equating it to like poor people are reactionary, but it's actually not like that. There is huge potential to build unity among working class people. And it's people who have class interests that are much more closely aligned with the actual ruling elite as compared to the working class that are the answer to why the, they're growing in support from the South Asian community. And it should be mentioned also, by the way, that after we won in Seattle, there is there was again a huge opening to win in other places and then right after we won there was an effort in the toronto school district and then now there's a, an effort going on in california and in both cases you can see when it when when these you know great issues issues where we can win historic victories they are co-opted for example in the california the what's happened by the democratic party then that's where they go to die you know, so the right. bill that's actually going to be voted on, if it does get a yes vote, then it's going to be a grossly watered down version of what we want. It's not, not actually going at this point. It's not. It started as a statewide bill, exactly like what we want in the city of Seattle, which is a ban on caste discrimination, where you can literally go to court and say that your corporation, the your employer did this to you. Uh, it started that way and now it has been completely watered down to simply saying that caste discrimination exists. And so this is a live example of how the Democratic Party certainly didn't do anything for $15 an hour. Last year, the California legislature killed an effort for Medicare for all. And this year, they are killing an oppression related issue. So it's not like, oh, they don't fight on economic issues, but they fight on oppression. No, they right. don't. They are not leading on trans rights. They failed to codify Roe v. Wade. And here now they are killing a bill on caste discrimination. And keep in mind, this is California legislature, which is almost 80 percent dominated by Democrats. So you recently participated in the labor summit with our friends over at RBN. Um, in which you appeared with Jill Stein, who I guess up until today or yesterday, uh, I don't remember which day it was, uh, she announced she was stepping down as his interim campaign manager since now they're going to bring in, I guess, the official full-time staff. Um, but you were talking a bit about the Cornell campaign and his candidacy. Uh, how would you grade his performance as a candidate thus far? Strengths and weaknesses? Um, and most importantly, because this is the question I concern myself most with, um, how confident are you that he'll actually stick it out till November of next year? Because it looks like the media and the Democrats and a lot of people who used to be on very good terms with him are trying to bully him out of the race now. And if I'm being honest, uh, I'm a little concerned that at some point he might give in. I hope he doesn't, obviously. But what's your take on all that? Yeah, I mean, first of all, you're you're absolutely right, Keith. And they have uh, gone on an offensive against him. And you can see it everywhere, you know, wherever he goes, whether it is Anderson Cooper or um, uh, one of those, um, even uh, the more somewhat yeah, Caitlin independent. Caitlin Collins, the new, the new one yeah, over there, yeah. Exactly. Uh, they are... Um, they are attacking him and uh, you know th almost every day there is in the news this uh, almost and you 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 guys played a very funny uh, clip where they were looking almost in mourning uh, as, as if almost Cornel West has already <laughs> yeah. tried Biden's campaign that was hilarious so yeah Indeed. I mean, yeah here I had uh, here I yeah. put this yeah, there you go. yeah. <laughs> set the mood. <laughs> yes, uh, exactly. Uh, and so that 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 shows that they are taking this dead seriously. And of course, the reason they are doing that is because not only have they not done anything for the working class, they are also um, running a candidate who is deeply unpopular. You know, to the point where if half the people say. I don't want to vote for either Trump or Biden. I'm waiting for something else. What does that tell you about the candidates, right? I mean, what does that tell you about the two parties? And uh, I, I think you, you, all, you all made a very important point, which was that in reality, uh, even though the Democratic Party has differences from Trump, they're really hoping that Trump is the Republican nominee because they think that in a matchup against Trump, Biden can win. That is such a dead end for working people like they are literally offering nothing and they're they also have the temerity to say things like how do we bring the black voters in line you know back in line or something like that maybe i'm not quoting it right but or they say keep them in line 
Uh, they, yeah, yeah so that was line. part of the same segment where she, the the woman, I forget who they were interviewing, she said explicitly what the Democrats are counting on is Donald Trump winning the nomination and they're counting on being able to fear monger against him so that they can win with nothing. Yeah, exactly. And they are completely, I mean, so they're busy demonizing Cornell West uh, and they are completely ignoring the fact that big sections of black voters and Latino voters and young voters are disenchanted from them. And so it's like, you know, I was thinking this morning, it's like the definition of the sore loser. They haven't even lost and they're blaming the other side. Right. And um, they are basically their, their tagline, the Democratic Party's tagline is, we can win if nobody runs against us, you know? So uh, that's pretty much what, what's going on there. And so in that context, first of all, Cornell West, for Cornell West to run all the way is absolutely crucial because this is something this can offer an organizing platform for working people, right? We're not, we're not in, um, we're not in fantasy land. We're not talking about, in you know, him winning the ca candidate, I mean, uh, presidency, because that's not something that we see happening. But what we do understand is that unless we have such kind of genuine left campaigns with, uh, a, you know, a sincere person running as a candidate and with a strong campaign, and I'll come to your questions in a second. Uh, that offers a, an opportunity for us to build something here, which is what we need most of all. And we need to get out of this thinking of, oh, well, you know, which is the candidate we can support who can win. That's not the, that's not very, the point here. Um, but in that context, yes, it is important for him to run all the way. And what's, what's uh, in terms of grading him and also what we want, what we need to see going forward, I think, that he has done tremendously in in many of his interviews you can see that he um he doesn't back down you know they attack him over and over again and he has never backed down on who he is and it helps that he is not a career politician it helps that he's been a lifelong activist that he he is who he is whether you agree with him or disagree with him He's not pretending to care about social and economic justice. He genuinely does care. And I think that's extremely important. I think going forward, it'll be crucial for not only him as the candidate, but also for the campaign as a whole to much more so than they are doing now. They are doing it, but I would like to see more is highlighting the kinds of uh, concrete demands that the campaign can bring people together on, like, you know, highlighting living wages, $25 an hour, uh, Medicare for all, canceling student debt, taxing Wall Street. This sort of thing is well, really I'm sorry important. to cut you off, but he, he yeah. backed your rent control bill, right? I yes. assume that's not a coincidence. I assume you had something to do with asking him <laughs> for it, <laughs> I'd imagine. Yeah, and, and actually, I mean, it really uh, also credit to Jill Stein. It, it actually happened right. on air. You know, when we were on RVN together, uh, two days before the labor summit, actually, I was talking about rent control and on air, she said, let's talk, let's talk offline. I, I need, need to make sure we send out a press release on this. And um, she helped make it happen. So that is exactly an example. It's, it's an example of the kind of real life issues that the campaign should engage on. And it, it you know, it in Seattle, I mean, it, yes, it's a small, very small example, but it's an important example that when we told the people who are fighting for rent control here that look at how the Democrats are selling you out. And here's Cornel West. He's calling it a moral imp imperative that had a huge impact on people's consciousness. So we need Cornel West's campaign to be um, uh, raising their profile on concrete issues on a national scale. You know, for example, they need to be speaking to the Teamster rank and file. They need to be talking to the, um, uh, the Hollywood actors and writers, strikers, all of those, you know, real life issues they need to be engaging on. I also think they could use some media help, um, you know, because I agree with you that he hasn't backed down off of any of his positions. But I do think, for example, in that Anderson Cooper interview, he could have been a lot stronger. Um, I think you would be a great person to coach him a little bit. I know that if Anderson were interviewing you and he tried to give you that Iraq Ukraine oh, bullshit, yeah. I mean, he would needed yes. a wardrobe break during a commercial if you were on. That. So <laughs> and I think yeah. Cornell let him let him railroad him a little yeah. bit there. So yeah. I'd like to see a little bit more teeth. I don't know if you yeah. obviously you're in, in touch with them, but uh, yeah. well, I think a few sessions with you would benefit him greatly. Yeah, okay. oh, I'm so glad you brought that up, Keaton, because I was also uh, watching when I was watching it, I was just um, I, I could barely sit to stay sitting, you know, because right, uh, right. you're totally right. That was a question 
where you have to go on an offensive you know really the answer to you know part of the answer to anderson cooper is are you kidding me you you have the nerve to talk about the iraq war right. in this yeah. like who are you like you know what is like you know to really expose not only anderson cooper but cnn as a whole right. as this kind of um, purveyor of outright lies Right. Exactly. Exactly. That whole thing where Anderson Cooper said, well, you can't compare the Russian bombing of Grozny to right. the U.S. bombing <laughs> of Iraq. I mean, just absolutely ludicrous. I made a little well, video. Well, edit well, that well you can't because it was so... actually a lot less brutal. Right. Is that what you mean? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Incredible. Um, all right. Let's talk a little bit about our friends at the DSA, shall we? Because uh, they just held their convention over the past weekend and they voted 704 to 184 for an electoral resolution which declared in part that quote it is not advisable for us to form an independent political party with its own ballot line at this moment they also rejected an amendment to that same resolution which stated quote it is dsa's expectation that socialists in elected office will vote and act in accordance with core principles of the socialist movement. <laughs> so they rejected an amendment that said, we as a socialist organization must hold our electeds to the standards of upholding socialist principles. And yet uh, they passed a resolution by what is it? 70%, 80% support, uh, which said no third party were committed to running on the Democratic Party ballot line. Um, I don't even need a question for there. I could just go to you for your response. That is, uh, I have to say, a sad state of affairs. And a lot of it, what, what, what it reflects is um, the bleeding of many genuine people that has happened. You know, the DSA grew by leaps and bounds. You know, they exploded in membership after the Trump election. Uh, and these were many of these were thousands and thousands upon young people who were looking, you know, who joined DSA in a search for a fight some kind of organ to fight back right they really wanted something to happen and then the the leadership has unfortunately helped to completely disintegrate this uh, organization and so now you have as you said a, a convention where a, you know it's a it's a socialist organization and it's completely rejecting the most basic ideas of independent politics and so uh, this is just, uh, you know, in, in many ways, this is a culmination of what has already been happening. Like if you look at the, uh, not only the the role that much of the DSA leadership has played in, as you said, in relation to not being able to hold elected leaders accountable, you know, when uh, AOC and the squad, except for Rashida Talib, br uh, broke the railroad worker strike and the whole thing with Jamal Bowman, all of those, you know, over and over again, more than one thing with Jamal Bowman, actually. So they not only did they do that, but they themselves, the leadership themselves, have tail ended the some of the uh, worst situations with the labor movement as well. It's not just on in, in on the electoral front, you know. So, for example, uh, some of the DSA leaders themselves are have been, you know, in social media attacking those who are calling for a vote no campaign inside. Uh, you know, in, in the in really the, wow, yeah, UPS That's amazing. agreement. Uh, That's uh, amazing. Agreement, yeah, I could see. I mean, I didn't expect them not to, you know, fold into the Democratic Party, but to go as far as to fight your no vote campaign. Yeah, I mean, that's and, and, amazing. You know, and, and, and exactly, and and you know what what's what's stunning about this, Keaton, is that one of the tweets they they sent out, they said something something along the lines, and I'm sure this was one of other tweets, many tweets, which said, you know, outsiders should not have an opinion uh, about this. I mean, that's what does incredible. that mean? You know, what does that mean? They're fucking the outsiders. They're a bunch of rich right. kids. They're a bunch right. of rich yeah. kids in DSA. They're outsiders. What are they, what are they, if, if they don't feel outsiders have a place in social <laughs> politics, then what the fuck are they doing? Would you hey, go to Starbucks? Don't, don't start screaming about burning the country down again <laughs> like exactly. you did with Thomas Frank. Just saying, DSA, outsiders shouldn't get involved. A bunch of trust fund kids telling people what they, I mean, come on. Yeah, and, and, and look at the other aspect of this also, right, in terms of outsiders. Where was this anger when Biden and the squad were selling right. out railroad workers? Like, what is what is what does it out what does outsider mean, right? So what we what we see in response is that when it's the question of uh, a working class issue, 
what's at stake is not only for that specific section of workers but for the working class as a whole and so whether we disagree or disagree and you know there's there's room for debate inside the labor movement but to say that any section of the working class should not have an opinion about another section of the working class's you know tentative agreement that doesn't work and uh, furthermore what's uh, what what kind of um, uh, what kind of opinions we should welcome and we should reject it depends again on class loyalties. So when Biden is interfering and breaking the strike, that's a bad thing. But when workers are saying, when some workers are saying vote no and some workers are saying vote yes, that's a legitimate debate. And so uh, this really is not an attack on, this not a, it's not a rejection of the vote no campaign in, in per se or outsiders, it's a rejection of uh, uh, any attempt to bring a, a rank and file uh, debate or discussion, you know, so we we don't we don't accept that sort of thing, and it is unfortunate that not only the DSA, but you know, this is this is what happens with business unionism as well. So if we are going to fight against business unionism, if we are going to build any kind of party for the working class, then the way forward, unfortunately, at this moment, does not lie through the DSA. Yeah, no, I mean that's that's really incredible. I I did not expect to hear that. That's a new one that they said, well, you shouldn't get involved. I mean, one of the things I love about Workers Strike Back just as a conception, and I mentioned this in, I think, the previous video that I think you saw, is that it's great to have a labor movement that is not tied to the bureaucracy of any particular union, right? Because where there is that link, there is the potential for, I don't necessarily want to say corruption, I think that's a little bit strong, but there's an incentive to fall in line, you know, to be part of the group, right? Whereas if you have this this mass movement of workers from all different kinds of unions or even non-unionized workers that will always show up for the most militant uh, factions of the rank and file. That's hugely important. And the idea that there would be any second guessing of that from a so-called socialist organization is just absolutely flabbergasting uh, in my view. Um, so speaking of uh, Democrats versus independents, you know, as we head into 2024, um, we're already seeing the Democrats' desperation in their attempts to, you know, caution the left or some progressive or liberal adjacent left. You know, there are different factions, I guess we could say. Uh, but they are, you know, broadly speaking, trying to warn against voting for a third party candidate like a Cornell West. So you are obviously a non duopoly politician and a movement leader. What is the case you make to those progressives and leftists who are on the fence, who are, you know, maybe their heart is with? Cornell, but they're afraid of the Republicans. And so they wanted to vote for Joe Biden. You know, I mean, we try to make that case as best we can, but I would love to hear, hear you make it. Right. I mean, I don't know if I'm going to uh, break any new ground here, but I think we have to first, our starting point has to be to analyze what created the opening for Trump and right populism in the first place. Unless we understand that it is easy to fall into this trap of well, I want to defeat Trump right now. First of all, you know, even setting the history aside or the context and analysis aside, look at the polls. The polls are not good news. You know, th there is right. in no way a guarantee that Biden is going to win. I mean, wasn't there a new poll just that came out days ago where they are literally tied? And yeah, the average of polls has yeah. them pretty much tied now. And yeah. the first New York Times poll of the cycle had them exactly tied, which right. a tie in the nationwide popular vote means Trump's going to win because the Democrats can win the popular vote by a few points nationwide and still lose the Electoral College. So yes, tie exactly. goes to Trump in terms of a yeah. nationwide popular vote. Yeah, exactly. And and as you said, you know, if you look at the uh, average of the polls, that's the in, indicate the prognosis is not favorable for Biden. So first of all, that itself is at this moment is a losing proposition. I mean, this is not, uh, you know, it's not um, 2020 anymore. It was certainly not 2016. These things have gone to the point where uh, you, you that argument is not flying anymore. Uh, and then and look at the state of Biden. I mean, literally, even his uh, even his uh, prominent donors are saying, you know, we are worried about his cognitive health and you know what, what's going on, that sort of thing. So you can imagine the lack of confidence on the part of ordinary people. But as I said, the starting point has to be the context in which this whole situation has arisen. And uh, unless we understand that, I, as I said, it's easy to fall prey to this idea that, well, just right now, it's not a good time. As AOC said, well, right now, it's not a good time. Well, that's the logic that has landed us in this uh, mess, hot mess in the first place, because 
the reason Trump was able to pose, I mean, he's a con man, right? Let's be clear. The reason, the only reason he was able to pose as this, you know, remember he said about the forgotten men and women and as, I mean, this guy is a multi-billionaire. How does he get to pose as an, as a, just a, you know, just an ordinary, whatever guy next door kind of guy? Uh, how does he do this? How does he, uh, how does he manage this duplicity? He manages it only because the alternatives are so corrupt and such rubbish, you know? So it's not that we should give him so much credit for what he's pulling off, but the fact is that because there is such vacuum of actual leadership for ordinary people, because ordinary people feel so very sold out and they're so angry and just disenchanted with what's on offer that now, you know, here you, you have this guy come along and just scoop up that vacuum. And uh, the more we head in that direction, the more there'll be an opening for Trump. You know, so look at what's happened, right? So Trump lost the election in 2020, but what have we seen since then? a growth in the Trump agenda, the growth in the space right. for a very dangerous agenda. And then next thing you know, the Democrats are losing the House. You have the MAGA, the ultra MAGA Congress members doing the force the vote that the squad right. refused to do. You know, so you're, what, what you've seen is a growth of right populism. And if you keep going down this path, then worse things are going to happen. So if you want to arrest it, the only way to arrest it is to create a left alternative and for that we need our own organizations our own campaigns and you know that's where Cornell west's campaign comes in yeah i mean russell always says it's not that trump is this extreme talent is that what is what do you always say russell he's been lucky he's, in he's, his he's very fortunate in his enemies right he's very right. lucky in who he's had to face um without a pandemic we'd be sitting in the second trump term right now no no doubt about it he just oh, scared yeah. He just scared people so much with, you know, he did everything he could other than to blow his nose with an N95 mask in the Oval Office. So people <laughs> yeah, yeah I mean, you know, exactly. Rather than give him credit, we should remind people that the Democrats are the best, the Democratic Party, I mean, not rank and file people, but the Democratic Party is the best builder of the right wing. They have been the ones oh, yeah. who have been, oh, yeah. you know, they've, they've not only, it's not only that they have, um, uh, failed to build working class movements or fight for something they refuse to fight you know so one that's one quibble i will have with uh, dr west is you know he say he it's really important that in this recent interview with the breakfast club he called out um aoc and uh, james clyburn and all of those people but he keeps uh and, and kamala harris but he keeps framing it as well they're afraid to come out and say it and maybe there is i mean i'm sure there's you know they're all chock full of cowardice I, I have no doubt about that but that's not the main thing driving them right the main thing driving them is that they are careerist politicians who are only too happy to um you know be uh, uh cheerleaders and even lieutenants for the agenda of the ruling class so they are not innocent people who are dragged along they are absolutely some of the instigators james clyburn right. is an instigator of right. the ruling class so we have to call them out for what they are and they are the reason the right wing has uh, has has this moment i mean look at this right so james clyburn plays a historically horrendous role to help biden against Bernie, you know in, in south carolina mm -hmm. And the next thing you what what are the statistics we're hearing? Eighteen percent of black people voted for Trump. I mean, this is the uh, you know so right. are, are the so would you conclude that black working class and poor people are stupid? Of course not. But they feel so unrepresented. They don't know where to turn, and that is why the only way we can get them back is not by uh, selling them. Uh, I was going to say new and refurbished Biden, but it's like the opposite of <laughs> old and decrepit, whatever. Sorry, I shouldn't be saying that. But you know what I'm saying? That that uh, is not the way to win them over, to present, the, re represent this thing and say, hey, look, there's Biden again. Will you vote for him? No, they're not going to. What we need is a genuine fighting left that is going to start fighting back. And again, the other point to introduce here in this discussion of, you know, how do we explain to people is, also just getting out of the clutches of this all just one campaign no we need an ongoing uh you know building of the left well we uh we were talking about this a little uh a little bit offline i, I want to focus in on this because you're 
you're better positioned to answer this question than just about anyone in the country. We were talking a little bit about this with Thomas Frank last week. He seemed to still think that the Democratic Party could be reformed. And, you know, basically we're saying, hey, we tried that. You know, we're not one of those who turned our back as soon as they rigged the primary against Bernie. We backed AOC. I, I personally campaigned for AOC when she was a complete unknown on the streets of Astoria. Uh, Ilhan Omar, Rashida Tlaib, we all got behind these people. And the final break was really their betrayal. Um, now, some people, specific, particularly with AOC, believe she always had bad intentions. I don't personally believe that. Um, but I believe that once they went there and faced the pressures involved, eventually they caved and you could kind of see the process. I recently saw Ilhan Omar for the first time. I hadn't seen her interviewed in a long time. It looked like something out of the Stepford Wives. I was like, what the hell did they do to them? Dude, our just had this vacuous smile. She didn't even, she didn't look like the person I remembered at all. I hadn't seen her for about a year in an interview and she just looked completely transformed. You faced these pressures and you're really perhaps the only example I can think of, of somebody who didn't cave. So what, from your experience and your insight from being in that position, what happened to them? What happened? It's like the zombie movie. You send them in and they turn into zombies. How does that happen? Yeah. And, and I, I like that uh, sort of uh, analogy of the, or metaphor of the uh, zombies. Um, and, and, and that is pretty much what happens. And part of the uh, response to this is the, uh, the need for the new party, like you know, for example, and I'll and I'll talk about uh, specifically also what what it requires the elected representatives of the left to do. But I want to make this point first because uh, in in the uh, it is very very difficult to do what I have done in the absence of your own organization, your own party, and that is not to say that having a party is a guarantee that you will be able to pull off what, what we have done in our office. But my point is that it is very, very hard to accomplish what we have accomplished if you're just one individual. And that is also not to in any way make excuses to uh, for, for excuses for the betrayals of AOC or anyone, absolutely not. There's no excuse for that. But my point is that for the left, if we want to actually strategically accomplish what we have done on but on a much bigger scale then we will need a party for the working class because what we have done into our office it would have been uh, virtually impossible had we not had socialist alternative you know had, had i not been part of socialist alternative which is an organization that has uh you know that that, that bases itself on a long understanding of history marxist history and is a democratically organized movement ourselves and that we together uh, make a decision on whether to run a campaign or not. And then we all stand together and our members themselves are um, part of the working class themselves. You know, many of us are union members. I started out as a member of the teachers union. No, none of us is a careerist politician. That's the most important thing. And even the uh, genesis of the campaign itself, you know, when we first ran, it was never uh, ever, it was never a question of, oh, I want to run and that's why we're going to run this campaign. No, actually, the 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 person who was the most resistant to be making me the candidate was me, uh, you know, because, you know, I, I didn't want to do this. But, you know, we have to do what we have to do when there are democratic decisions being taken by the organization. The point is that these are not career campaigns or personalized campaigns. These are campaigns that were decided by the working class organization together because we saw a strategic opening where we could demonstrate an example of working class politics. So that starting point itself shows you the fundamental difference. And uh, no matter how genuine somebody is, if the campaign is run on the basis of them making political careers, then that's 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 the starting of the problem, you know. So, like you said, we right. don't need to divine in their heads and understand whether they were genuine or not to begin with. Let's assume they were, you know. Let's give let's start with the best starting point. Even there, what you will have is what you got with the squad. And bottom line, and there's a lot to say, but let me just say one thing. Bottom line, the reason this happens is actually something that AOC herself, uh, in one moment of honesty. She said recently, you know, in, in I think it was in the context of the 
the when when the MAGA politicians did the force the vote, she was asked, why didn't you do it? She said something along the lines of, well, there would be relational harm right. with your party. I think that is where the truth lies. And I can tell you from my own experience, and, and, and it's not for me, it was not something traumatizing because I don't approach this as, as I said, personalized, you know, this is my political duty. So I, when I go to city hall, I don't look at the eight Democrats on, on the city council as my colleagues. That's not the case. This is not a normal work environment right. that should be made clear. It's not like when you go to like, you know, when Keaton was at UPS or when Starbucks workers go to work, you absolutely need to build solidarity with your coworkers. But when I, as an elected representative, go to city hall, the city, other city council members are not my work colleagues. They are representatives of the ruling class whose interests are antithetical to the people I'm fighting for. And so you have to be willing to understand that your role there is not to play nice with them. And, and you know, the thing is, sometimes they will even say they will, you know, maybe take the correct votes or do some correct things. But the, the crux of this whole thing is something that's never talked about, which is that you need to call them out by name. And that is, and you need to use your office as an organ to build movements. I mean, these two things are very important components. So if you don't do that, you are going to be left isolated. So either you will become a, you know, one of the zombies, or you'll be marginalized. Either way, you're going to be of no use. What we have accomplished is not sell out and not be marginalized. And for that, you need your own forces. And your forces are the people who are willing to fight alongside you. And so, you know, just to quote one of the uh, one of the corporate uh, landlord lobbyists who said that uh, what they really feared, what he said correctly, that the Democrats feared what he called Sawant's army. And what he meant by that was, it's not just Shama Sawant, it is all these renters and working people who are in city hall and exposing the Democrats' lies. Right, but they had your back when you were recalled, and you've right. made this point in the past. The reason they have your back is because you fight for them very, very hard when you're there. If you went in there and pulled an AOC, then when the Democrats came at you, you'd have no army in back of you. The reason exactly. you have that army in back of you is because you are the thorn in their side that you promised to, to be. Exactly. And and that's that's the that's the basis on which, as you said, we defeated the recall attempt in 2021. And that was essentially the fourth election we we won. You know, so when we leave in December, we're going to leave undefeated despite everything stacked against us. Indeed. Russell, go ahead. All right. So uh, I follow every ideological spectrum of media to see what the conversation is conservatives and conservative media have a field day with riots. Uh, they love the Chaz autonomous zone. They love to get into that. Um, and they will usually point at that. They'll point at Seattle. They'll point at Portland. They'll point at San Francisco. They'll point at Los Angeles. They'll use these as examples proving that leftists, progressives, Democrats can't run cities. But if you let them run cities, you get homelessness, you get crime, you get violence, you just get, you make everything worse. Even for the poor people, you make everything worse. How do you, and, and, and also we have a very viewpoint diverse audience. A lot of our communist friends really don't like riots, things, you know, kind of uncontrolled mass demonstrations because they feel it's counterproductive. So how do you feel about that? How do how do you counter those kinds of claims from the right that these Democrat run cities are an example of why the left shouldn't govern? And how do we speak about things like mass riots or the autonomous zone? Do we disown them? Do we embrace them? How do we speak about them? I mean, so when you when when the people you're talking about say that they don't like riots, I assume they mean uh, violence or mayhem, that sort of thing. Yeah. So if you look at the facts on the ground, the violence and mayhem was almost entirely unleashed by Seattle police, not by the movement itself. And 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 I can say that for full confidence. First of all, because 
I know what happened, you know, I know the statistics. And I also know from anecdotal evidence from having been there myself day after day after day and having got tear gassed myself. You know, I was I was I was amazed when I was literally I was standing there. I was not looking at the police. I mean, you had all these uh, police with riot gear on and these weapons I have never seen before in my entire life standing there armed to the teeth and we were all standing there with no with no protection of course you know we are just ordinary people and i was literally having a political conversation with a young activist when i have this hit my eye and so if you if the people who are watching this have an objection to violence and destruction and mayhem then please know that the instigators of any of that happening was the seattle police and who are the seattle police they are they are an institution of the capitalist state and they serve at the behest of the seattle mayor and the seattle city council and who are they they are the democratic establishment of the city and so ultimately whatever people you know whatever objections people have about the bad things whatever they lie at the doorstep of the democrats and as a matter of fact the the violent response of seattle police against the protests was uh, built that, that actually built so much unity among uh, uh, ordinary people in seattle that even the people who were very hesitant to come out and march with black lives matter you know feeling that may, having mixed feelings about it they actually ended up either marching or at least speaking out in city council public comment because they were so angry because they saw with their own eyes what was happening these are just ordinary people ordinary workers young people retirees p children you know disabled uh, community members just marching on the street because they care about racial justice, social justice, economic justice. And suddenly out of nowhere, you have these police armed to the teeth, you know, attacking you. And in fact, it was on the basis of that mass anger, just justifiable mass anger at the police that my office was able to win an absolutely astounding historic victory, which was a ban on these so-called crowd control weapons. The law we won prohibits the Seattle police from using, indiscriminately using uh, tear gas, rubber bullets, choke holes, all of that, you know, just brutal weapons. They call them less lethal weapons, which is such a right. uh, strange euphemism. Like, what does that mean? Less lethal, like less lethal than what? Like the outright being shot with bullets? Okay, right. fine. But they're so horrendous. And, and uh, one last point I'll say on this is that we won this um, a ban on crowd control weapons in the midst of Black Lives Matter, no thanks to the BLM misleaders. This is what I'm talking about. You know, when, at the end of the day, who stood for the genuine gains that the Black Lives Matter movement was fighting for? It wasn't, unfortunately, the BLM leaders. It wasn't the labor movement, which failed to provide any leadership during, during BLM. And it wasn't the DSA leaders either who just came there, you know, to tail end the misleaders of Black Lives Matter. So this also triggered a real discussion around identity politics and the failures of that and also really opened the eyes of a lot of people about the Democratic Party itself. You know, the year after we won the weapons ban, the Democrats then diluted it. So you won that weapons ban. That was because we interviewed Brian, uh, your your former campaign manager, in the run up to that recall, and he mentioned that. So what was the date on that? That had to be right after the Chaz and the Chop, right? It was shortly after that. It was around that time that yeah. we were able to yeah. win, and then when and this is what the Democrats do. You know, this is why I always say that Democrats are a graveyard of social movements. Is that in the midst of Black Lives Matter? they didn't have the guts to push back against it. i mean they tried their best but they knew they were not going to win because i mean when we when we uh, brought the weapons ban legislation forward i was moved to tears at the hundreds of people who were testifying and as i said it wasn't the leaders who were the unfortunately the black leaders who were organizing it it was just regular people who came because they heard from us or just because they felt motivated and they came and spoke about the weapons and how aghast they were about it and that they supported it. And so at that moment, we were able to win because of the support of the movement. The year after when the movement had subsided, that's when quietly the Democrats come and dilute it. And this was this was a bill brought forward by one of the so-called progressive Democrats. It's just shameful. Well, this, this is one of the problems that we have. 
when people think left, they think Democrat and they don't, most people, they're, they're not that involved in politics. They don't realize we're at each other's throats. So they look at uh, Washington state and they don't know, we did a segment on this. They don't know that Washington has a more regressive taxation system than Texas. They don't know that. We wouldn't do that, but the Democrats do. And a lot of the social problems that they see is an outgrowth of policies that we don't actually support. Uh, but I, I'm sure you know, you personally are often used as the face of that by conservatives, very often. Um, so another question I wanted to ask, kind of building on that. Um, so I, I, I'm not clear on the details. You got a per head on employees tax passed and then it was repealed in Seattle. Was that yeah, yeah, I get Sorry, go ahead. Well, well, you've said you can't have a socialist country in isolation, right? That, that there have to be other socialist countries. So what do you do about trying to pass things like that in a municipality, in a country where you've got a kind of hunger game situation, where the municipalities are fighting each other to get these businesses to come into their districts? Like when AOC, before she became the shell of herself she is now, when she fought against Amazon, they left, right? They, they went somewhere else and then she caught the blame for that. So what do you do about that in a country where they can just go to Texas, they can just go to Florida? How do you create policies that are actually good for the community without another less conscientious municipality using that as an opportunity to steal that business? Yeah, that's that's a great question. Just, just before I respond to that, the, you said a very important thing, which is that the right wing, the conservative media, right wing media likes to conflate uh, socialists and the left like us uh, with the Democratic Party and just, you right. know, pa paint everybody the same picture. And, and, and that's really unfortunate because I mean, obviously they do it because it serves their interests. But it's unfortunate in the sense that then genuine people who could be won over think that we are responsible for the sellout by the Democrats. You're, you're absolutely right about that. And in fact, that is exactly why I just wanted to say quickly that that's exactly why uh, uh, independent left campaigns are crucial because, you know, in the absence of a new party at this moment, we don't have that. So right now, most urgently, we need independent left campaigns that can show the distinction between, you know, the Cornell West and the right campaign and the Biden campaign and the Biden presidency and the Biden White House, you know, it, it's only by having Cornell West there that you can show the distinction. And that's precisely why also, you know, going back to Keaton's earlier point, uh, it really is important that Cornell West gives his campaign a mass grassroots character, which links up with the real life issues that people are facing here. Uh, and then on, on the question about, you know, how do you, how do you deal with the fact that uh, the, the, I mean, capitalism is a global system. So as long as they have a labor force that is poorer and more desperate than our labor force in our local region, they have the freedom to move their capital. And that's that's just a fact. And th that actually, it's a, it's a very important point because it, it helps to explain why uh, socialists, Marxists like myself, who are not, we are not reformists in the sense that we don't believe that reforms are anywhere enough. We are uh, revolutionaries. We believe that actually we need a different system altogether and we are in it for that. Uh, but why we as Marxists actually make the best fighters for reforms is precisely because we understand that and then we bring an analysis to bear. So what, what I mean by that is, for example, when we were fighting for $15 an hour uh, in uh, 2014, a lot of the businesses, you know, the Chamber of Commerce made that point. Like they basically said, oh, well, it's apocalypse time in Seattle. All the businesses are going to leave and we are going to uh, have, um, you know, the, then work, the, work, the very workers you're trying to support will be left bereft by right. you. Basically, they portrayed us as anti work right. Exactly. Right. Uh, the way we countered that is in two parts. One, first of all, use all the statistics that are on your site. You know, don't be shy to use statistical evidence. The statistical evidence shows that actually that's not what happens. Minimum wage increases have never resulted in closure of businesses. And this is something that economists have said. Now, you, you got to know, you got to arm yourself with the facts. And that's part of what we did. 
a big reason why we uh, won over, you know, towards the end, uh, like 80% of the, um, you know, in the polls, 80% of Seattle in favor of 15 is because we politically educated people because that's what they were hearing from everyone in the media. We said, well, actually, that's not true. But we didn't stop there. And here's where being a socialist matters. We said that that's not true. But think for a moment, if that were true, that if everything was going to collapse because of $15 an hour, just giving an above poverty wage to workers, then what are we doing defending this system in the first place? If it's so bad that bringing 100,000 workers over poverty was going to help the system collapse, then we need a new system, don't we? So that right. argument combined with the statistical evidence really made a big difference. And then also what we said was that if businesses could leave, then the solution to that is not to accept low wages everywhere because that's a race to the bottom everywhere. Instead, let's win 15 here. That will force uh, politicians in other places to also pass wage increases because it will raise the worker confidence. And furthermore, if workers get better wages here, then it will put pressure on businesses uh, you know, outside Seattle to also increase wages. So it's the combination of this kind of That's happened, offensive. Yeah. yeah. And, and we That's... should, and, and sorry, another you know, no, the go on, go on. bottom line lesson from all of this is never go on the defensive, always be on the offensive. That's it. That's why you're uh, one of the few people in this fight who's actually been winning these battles because you don't back down. I, I think that's part of why people respond to someone like Trump. Remember, everyone, everyone thought he was done when he said about John McCain, he prefers people who didn't get captured. People thought that's it. That's the end of him. The fact that he refused to retract it actually helped him a lot. You, you see all of these uh, you know, Democrats, these squad members, they don't have the courage of their convictions. It's not that their ideas are not popular. It's that they won't stand by them the way that you have in uh, in your position. I mean, look at the just look at that weapons ban, right? I mean, in the aftermath of those George Floyd protests, you saw the police make a big rebound because people were afraid of defunding the police and what's going to happen if we defund the police? So people started funding the police more, right? The cops started winning. You after that actually win a weapons ban to demilitarize the police right after all that as the cops are winning everywhere in seattle they're losing because of you and, and the movement that you you built so russell i know you had one more question it's kind of in keeping with that previous one so do you want to do that one and then we'll get to some audience questions yeah and i, ju I just want to mention also uh, since we're on this you know you know in new york we have stonewall and we have the big anniversary here every year celebrated out there. Something I'll often point out to people is they've militarized the police force so much since then. Stonewall would never happen today. It's inconceivable when you look at that story, if you know how they police in New York City, that they would have allowed that to happen. They would have shot them. They would have uh, today. They would. There's no doubt in my mind. They would. They would break that up almost immediately. So this is. This is a little off script, Kay, just to warn you. Um, the reason that I do worry about the way a lot of that conservative framing is because I'm old enough to remember the Reagan revolution. I was a, I was a child, but I remember how that happened. And so much of the conversation leading into Reagan's election was fear and paranoia about crime. It's the easiest way to appeal to people. To, to get them afraid for their safety and oh these crazy leftists they're gonna they're gonna destroy your city and and I think it's a very difficult thing to counter when they start propagandizing against the left that way I think it's something we have to be able to answer uh, oh absolutely we we uh, absolutely have to answer and just actually on on your earlier point about how uh, Trump doesn't back down. And, and that's exactly why the danger lies as well, right? If if we don't have a fighting left, then Trump looks like the only guy who is worth voting for. That's because it. sometimes I, and I've heard people say that um, that I don't actually agree with Trump, but I like that he fights. Nobody else right. fights for right. what yeah. they believe in, you know, but right. that's the problem. He's a disingenuous, actually, and a dangerous uh, he represents a dangerous agenda for the working class, for the poor, for our, our society itself, for the vision of a decent society itself. But he's the one who looks like a fighter, and that's a problem. In fact, let's be clear, Trump 2.0, if that happens, is going to be 
even more dangerous than um, you know, he's going to be even more energized to for, for his dangerous agenda than he was uh, before. And um, um, sorry, what was your uh, the I lost my train of thought. Yeah. <laughs> it's OK. Um, just how we answer that fear mongering. Yes. Of crime. Yeah. I think the best way to answer that is, first of all, you know, explaining uh Again, as I said, arm yourself with statistical evidence. What does the evidence show? It shows that, uh, sorry, let me back up. Here. The first starting point of the left, and this is uh, often I've seen people on the left, even genuine people making the mistake, is poo-pooing the genuine fears of working people around public safety. Uh, a lot of ordinary people, working people, you know, low-income people, have public safety concerns. Why? Because they are some of the worst victims of right. crime and right. they pay the biggest price. I mean, you know, I, I, my own example, like our car was broken into uh, actually in the middle of the 2013 campaign. And for us, uh, it was a big deal because it was, you know, $1,500 to all told to, to replace it. Can you imagine how much money that is for ordinary people when they don't have $400 in the bank right. for a financial so. emergency? So I, I think the worst possible starting point if we want to win people over is to minimize the genuine concerns. And we should actually, starting point should be that, yes, it's a real concern. And it is working people and poor people who are the worst uh, victims of this kind of thing. And then what does uh, research show? What does uh, social science show? It shows that the best antidote to public safety, the best way to build safe neighborhoods is to actually fully fund public programs that allow uh, you know, uh, the vast majority of people to improve their living standards, funding for public schools, uh, uh, social housing, uh, uh, safe roads, public transportation, all of that, you know, jobs programs, after school programs, all of that is needed. And how are you going to fund all of that? You need to tax the rich. You know, the rich people don't face crime because they don't have, you know, they, we have income segregated neighborhoods. They have gated communities. You know, the people who voted against me uh, four times, they live in gated communities. They don't face the crime. And the working class people who voted for me in, you know, in very large numbers, 85% often in some precincts, they are the ones who face the problem. It's uh, LGBTQ neighbors who face attacks on them. Homeless neighbors face the worst crime attacks. So the best way to lift all of this and you know address all of these problems is precisely the kind of programs we are fighting for. And that means a working class fighting agenda to tax rich people, to fully fund public services, and to oppose uh, what's, you know, which is um, basically a uh, um, um, a cutting of the budgets and uh, really austerity budgets, you know, opposing austerity right, budgets. Right. Um, all right. Final question, an appropriately big subject. Um, I think a lot of us were kind of in this movement today. Uh, we all worked on the Bernie campaign. I mean, most of us. And now you've kind of got this, what we call a post duopoly left. We're done with the two parties. We're done with the Republicans, the Democrats. Ideologically, we're all over the place. And I think for a lot of us, we're not, we're fighting individual battles, but there's kind of a conversation going on about what this is all leading to, what the vision is, what the overall plan is. Do you have a specific idea broadly of how you would want to reform the American economic and political system, get rid of the electoral college, go to a parliamentary system, sky's the limit. What would you want to see? Well, I I want to go as far as international socialism. <laughs> so uh, if you ask me that question, that's how I would I would respond. But as far as the more um, immediate question you're asking about. Uh, what kinds of the way I would interpret your question is what kind of concrete demands would we fight on? Yes, all of that actually. But the ones that we would we would um, sort of zero in on to build a concrete fight back around would be based on where we think the most consciousness is in 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 terms of willingness to fight back. You know, so for example, uh, let, let me use concrete examples. Uh, let's say a concrete demand of ending student debt by forcing Wall Street to eat the eat the eat the debt, uh, and ending the electoral college. 
they are both important things but i would think that the mass support for ending student debt would be so much more tremendous and so much clearer compared to the other demand so that's that's one of the uh, one of the uh, analysis that we would use to decide where to put our energies into so when we were fighting for $15 an hour for example when we when we launched our first city council campaign $15 an hour became the flagship demand we also talked about taxing the rich and rent control but the reason we made 15 the main demand that we were building our campaign on was because we had a finger on the pulse of consciousness and we recognized this is the thing that is going to really at this moment activate a lot of people and energize them into action and that was correct and during blm actually you know so as you said russell correctly in 2018 we had won an amazon tax and the democrats shamefully repealed it yeah, right. less than a month later yeah it was insane i was actually heading for a vacation at that time you know very very short vacation and we were driving out and i had to come back into city hall because i just heard that they're about to repeal it i mean it was completely insane it's like you can't make up these stories uh, and so then we won the Amazon tax later in 2020 in the midst of BLM. Why? Again, because we recognized that there was a huge opening for it. And we were right. I mean, literally the clipboards were being snatched by the people of all races, but including black people who said, give me that clipboard. I want to tax Amazon. Yeah. You know, right, right. so uh, it's understanding what makes sense at a given moment is, is, is crucial. And that's why strategy and analysis is serious business. We don't approach this in a in a blase fashion. That's why in Socialist Alternative, we have uh, long discussions, debate, and writing, but we don't do that in, in, in an intellectualized way. You know, it's not like for academic satisfaction. We do this to inform our action. All righty. Well, thank you so much uh, for taking those questions from us, Shama. We have some from the audience, if that's all right with you. So, Tusker. Thank you, Shama is a member asks what does shama think of the uaw's 10 demands overall uh and which of the demands does she think are the most revolutionary she's talking about the looming uaw strike which if it happens uh will happen on the same day that you launch your youtube show right september 14th yes so yes. there you go that could be a hell of a pilot episode for you if they get a, if you, if you get a uaw strike on the day you launch your show i mean you that, can't, that's can't how they find timed it, better it. Than that. yeah exactly yeah yeah oh and by by the way sorry i'm sort of thinking about previous questions as you go to the next questions i just i should just mention for your audience uh for your viewers our second amazon tax by the way was four times larger than the first tax and uh you know so that was a nice f you to the chamber of commerce to jeff bezos and to the democrats sorry i just had to say that I, hang on that one ultimately passed yes yes that one that, that, one, that passed, one passed. And as i said right now it's raising um almost uh, 300 million dollars per year so it is it's pretty phenomenal and obviously as i said it's not enough but um it is it is the one of the most significant achievements that we have won. Um, as far as the UAW 10 demands are concerned, I mean, you know, let's just go over the demands that they have put forward. It's like eliminating tiers on wages and benefits, increasing wages, restoring of cost of living uh, allowances, you know, basically cost of living adjustment, a defined benefit pension, which is, again, just to make uh, for, for your viewers who don't might not know, you know, it, the defined benefit pension used to be there. Uh, I'm sure you you all know, and and then it sort of got eroded because it was actually a more secure pension for workers, and of course there was a corporate assault on it. Uh, I mean, it's hard to respond to this question in the sense that all of these demands are extremely important. Uh, I would say, from a strategy standpoint, it should be it would be important for us as union members, you know, if UAW members are building around it, to really uh, build momentum around the demands that. Are, that have the ability to encompass as big of the membership, as much of the membership as possible, you know, basically demands that apply to everyone, because those are the demands that allow you to bring the membership together. So cost of living adjustments for everyone, defined benefit pensions for everyone. Those are the demands I would really bring forward. And, and, and what I would do is not so much uh, like having a tier of the demands, but understanding that the strategy around each of those demands should be that you fight for all your members, not 
allow the bosses to make a division between the more well-paid members with you know workers with more seniority versus other members. For example, one of the things that of concern we've heard from UPS Teamsters is that there might be uh, the, the approach that the leadership might have used is not the best in terms of uh, fighting for pension, where regionally there are sort of now com competition among what pension plans the workers might win. Now, that's not a good approach. Instead, you should uh, unite all the members for the best possible pension plan for all the workers and reject the divide and conquer by the bosses. So fundamentally, I would say pick the demands that have the most momentum around them, that you know that most members are inspired to fight around, and then fundamentally reject divide and conquer. I don't care which demand it is, you just reject divide and conquer. We have to push back against that kind of idea and bring all members together. And I think ultimately it's also important for them to build community-wide solidarity. We know how much solidarity there is. I mean, you know, it's it almost seems like a like an age ago, but let's not forget there was striketober that happened. And many of these workers actually won so won their strike actions because there was so much support around them. Because that also that community support also puts pressure on the bosses to force them to concede. So all of those um ideas I would bring forward and, and I think uh, ultimately, also the demands that are related to the cost of living adjustment, I would imagine, are some of the most galvanizing ones, just given how bad the cost of living crisis is. All righty. This is sort of a darkly funny question from Rodrigo. What's Shamas and do dissident stance on Lockheed workers, Lockheed Martin workers? <laughs> this is something that Chris Hedges talks about a lot. He talks about how, you know, one of the only manufacturing bases left in America is the weapons manufacturing. So do you want to take that one? Uh, I think I think uh, this is uh, in many ways analogous to um, the uh, the approach of socialists to the rank and file of the military, and also to maybe workers who are in the prison system. You know, who are maybe uh, the prison officers. You know, because like for example, here their real questions have emerged. They are public. They are part of the public sector union. They are Teamsters or Protect 17 members. They are members of different public sector unions, uh, and they are prison officers. And it does create complicated issues because ultimately, as socialists, as Marxists, we are fighting against the capitalist state itself. And that implies we are, our fight is against the institutions of capitalism, which means the 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 prison industrial complex, you know, uh, mass incarceration against prisons as a whole and, and as um, against the military and so on and against imperialist war. But in that process, we have to understand that we have to bring workers towards us. So just the honest answer would be that this wouldn't be, um, a, it's not like I, this would be my starting point, but if Lockheed workers were to fight on some workplace issues and they would go into struggle then we would the correct thing would not be to abandon them but to have a very principled and truthful position where we say this is our position on military and weapons and capitalist violence and war imperialist war but we will not be able to win a socialist society unless we win uh, we bring work the working class together and so on that basis we stand with you so in other words we don't have to hide our position but at the same time, we offer solidarity. I think that is the best position to have if we want to win the workers over to our side. I think the same logic applies to fossil fuel workers. That is why a climate change program for socialists is a non-starter unless we say we have we are fighting for you know, a just transition for fossil fuel workers. We're not fighting against them. Right, right. An actual just transition, right. not learn right. to code, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. We, we'd have to actually idea. do what was always <laughs> actually promised to do it, yeah. for these workers that never delivered. Uh, I'm going to yeah. jump the order slightly just because this is a related question. And by the way, folks, if you gave us a super chat, that's not a question for Shama. We will get to that. We're getting to the Shama questions first so that we don't keep Shama here uh, all night. But this is related, and I thought this was a good one. What is the strategy of worker strike back to galvanize union workers against U.S. imperialism? And we talked about DSA earlier, so I'll just throw as a little add-on to this. Part of the reason why I think DSA is so weak is because 
I think Bernie had a real blind spot when it came to foreign policy. As we're seeing now, he's very supportive of this Ukraine funding. And so I think the movement that really was the beneficiary of the Bernie movement, DSA, has that same sort of blind spot, little to no critique of empire or NATO or anything. I mean, you don't hear a peep from them on Russia, Ukraine. So uh, I just wanted to add that to that question. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think uh, not much has been said actually on the left about this issue. And uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, it is unfortunate the position that much of the DSA leadership has taken in relation to the war in Ukraine. I mean, I, I can tell you both from a worker strike back standpoint and also uh, the position of socialist alternatives. So if you look at the demands that worker strike back has put forward, the one of the demands, the fifth demand, uh, so to say, is it, it's not like they're ranked, but you know, it is one of the demands is where we say no more sellouts, we need a new party. And in, in that, we say that we need a party, obviously, that would uh, bring forward the working class uh, demands that we want and would uh, where all elected leaders would only accept the average worker's wage, like I do. Uh, but also, we say we need a party that consistently opposes war and imperialism. So we are not, we're even in, uh, in, in worker strike back, we're not shy of that issue, I think, because it, it is extremely important. And the position that socialist alternative has taken, which is what we are very clear about uh, in bringing forward in worker strike back as well, although we obviously need much more discussion inside worker strike back, is that we are against both Russian imperialism and US imperialism. We, we don't fall into the pitfalls right. of, you know, um, supporting one versus the other because imperialism is imperialism. And unless we understand that the Ukraine war is not some one-off instance, but is the opening salvo of the new era, you know, of the new Cold right. War, the era of the new Cold War, we really are not able to understand what's happening. So we have to be very clear. We're against both Russian and U.S. imperialism, and we need a global anti-war movement to end the war. But obviously that's a little bit complicated because there isn't a real anti-war movement that's developing right now. But we have to have the ability of looking into the future a little bit without a crystal ball. And it, history shows us that even though it isn't there right now, an anti-war movement isn't there right now, the longer that this war drags out or the more that other wars emerge, imperialist wars emerge, for example, Taiwan, you know, uh, and other more, even more deadly situations, then there is the potential for that to develop because working class people will start speaking up. I mean, in the first days of the Vietnam War, it wasn't there. But ultimately, the Vietnam War was defeated and the American ruling class had uh, an ignominious defeat because of the fight back both, uh, you know, uh, in, in the United States, you know, combined with labor movement and women's movement and black liberation movement, but also, most importantly, the courageous actions by the rank and file members of the military themselves. And so this can happen, an anti-war movement can develop, and that's where we have to point to. And, and just one, one thing I'll say, one of the most um, uh, uh, difficult sources of confusion that exists is about the Ukrainian working class themselves. Like, don't you think we should support the war in order to be on their side? And we have to clarify that in no way, shape or form is this war in on the side of the, you know, uh, 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 what, what I mean specifically is NATO and US weapons and Zelensky regime in no way, shape or form are they for the Ukrainian working class. As a matter of fact, right. the Ukrainian working class and poor people's blood is being spilled. Right. Their rights are being attacked on. In fact, Zelensky has carried out a whole host of anti-labor attacks in the name of protecting Ukraine. And so we should have zero illusions in the Zelensky regime. It is a reactionary imperialist regime. And we have to be against both that and NATO and be very clear that the new Cold War between the US and China is going to be a bigger and bigger threat to the working class as we go. Uh, you know, there's a real risk of a new world war. And so unless we get our position correctly now, there will be hell to pay later. Yeah, that's an issue where I think Cornell does say it pretty perfectly, which is that he's in solidarity with the suffering of the Ukrainian people. Yeah. Right. while at the same time being anti-NATO, right? Yes. Um, I think that's that's exactly the right uh, tone there. You don't like my music, asks, any future plans or ambitions to get elected to government? When are you running again and where? 
or are you? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, ambitions zero. I mean, as I said, it's not personalized in any way. And uh, uh, on a personal level, just to be honest, it's it would not be my preference. But it's uh, but it's not personalized in every direction. You know, it's not personalized in wanting to run. It's also not a personalized decision in not wanting to run. In other words, if there is a real strategic opportunity for the working class for for us to run then we will absolutely do that but we cannot just be attached to and not that the questioner is saying this but i'm just saying that it's it's not we cannot just be attached to electoral campaigns at the end of the day we need to build serious movements and those movements will not be serious when i say serious i mean business and that means we need serious leadership in those movements and that leadership also needs to be provided all right. Ruthless uh, criticism, in, a big donation. Sorry, Russell, were, In keeping with what you were saying there, you didn't once say me or I when asked about running. You said we. Right. Exactly. Yes. Ruthless criticism. Thanks for that big donation and that big question, my friend. We appreciate that very much. Shama, how can a mass workers' party develop under the guise of what is otherwise a factional workers' party, re Trotsky versus Stalin? Are there attempts by socialist alternatives to actively transcend or not ignore their history? Um, we don't we don't uh, ignore history in any way. I mean, uh, I think ignoring history is uh, would spell the death knell of the global working class. Uh, I think the reality is that for the vast majority of young people who are radicalizing and politicizing and would actually become you know the new generation of militant fighters i don't think that they are to be again brutally honest they, i don't think they're preoccupied with this type of uh, um, debate because they don't know about it what i think what what i think we need to do is to build um, both a mass organization like a mass workers party at the same time, we are not coy about building socialist alternative either. I think they're both crucial, and we don't hide our politics. We are we are Marxist. We are Trotskyist. Uh, we are absolutely against any kind of uh, you know Stalinist agenda. We saw the disaster that happened. You know where uh, the the genuine working class led R Russian revolution, socialist revolutions uh, it, gains were for the most part. Uh, then, you know, over the period destroyed not only by Stalinism, but that happened on, in the context of the assault by the global capitalist class. So we're obviously not advocating for that type of agenda. We're talking about what um, the Bolsheviks, the Russian fighters at that time when the 1917 revolution happened, what they were fighting for, which is a genuine workers revolution. So we are not um, we don't hide this in any way. We are happy to participate in debates. We, you know, we Brian and I, for example, did a debate um, some months ago uh, with Eric Blanc and Bhaskar Shankara on on these questions. So hopefully, maybe we can talk about those questions in more detail at, in one of your future shows. Uh, please and, send me a link to that debate. I, I would will, love to. Yeah, we'll definitely do that, and I would <laughs> yeah. be happy to come uh, we'll on stream show. it. Yeah, well, well, yeah, we yeah, could, please, we could stream do. it with commentary. That would be amazing. Yeah. Please do. And please invite us for the commentary. We would love to be part of that, Brian and I. Sure. And, uh, you know, so so as I said, you know, we, we want to engage in these discussions, but we also should not lose sight of the fact that uh, while being truthful, we also have to uh, bring forward the kind of politics that is accessible to a lot of people that a, lo a whole lot of people are going to agree with. So in other words, we are building socialist alternative. And as I said, we are not shy about it. Uh, and at the same time, we don't believe that socialist alternative is going to be the mass party. You know, we, we are calling for a mass working class party. Socialist alternative will be uh, uh, part of that party. But we understand that there will be other trends as well. We will we will ruthlessly fight for our ideas because we have full confidence in what we are bringing forward. I mean, look at the DSA. I mean, unfortunately, the DSA leadership has made a giant case for our politics you know i i can, I can right. only do that. <laughs> sure thing and that's got to be a change i mean i'll, I'll add on to that because i thought of that for a question for you too yeah. is that you know you're part of socialist alternative obviously you're a marxist yourself but i believe you said and correct me if i'm wrong i'm not 100 percent sure i have this completely right i believe you said that workers strike back is not branding itself as an explicitly socialist organization it's simply a labor activist organization is that correct and what's the yeah. difference between because you've you've obviously put 
your politics, I don't want to say your ideology, but your politics, which are certainly informed by your sort of ideological set, you've certainly put those front and center as a member of the council. What's it like sort of pivoting to a, a, an organization that is less ideological in nature? Uh, it's it's not so much a pivot in the sense that I'm still who I am, socialist right. alternative, still who we are. So I when so so when for example this question that came up, I don't hide that I am a Trotskyist in any way, but I'm not requiring that worker strike back activists also embrace Trotskyism. Some of them will. In fact, I, I was just talking. We had our worker strike back meeting on Monday night in Seattle, our monthly meeting, and I was talking to. Uh, one of our members, socialist alternative members, and I was a very new member, very young, and I was asking him, how did you end up joining? And he said, I actually joined Worker Strike Back first, and then I joined Socialist Alternative. So some of that is going to happen. Right. But the reason we launched Worker Strike Back is because we know, as I was saying earlier, that there are tens of thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands of young people including inside the labor movement, but not only inside the labor movement, because obviously that represents a small fraction of the workers. Unfortunately, at this moment, most workers are not unionized. But the point is that most there are so many young people who want to join a real fight back as uh, described by the worker strike back strategy, but don't have any organi organization, any, um, any pole of attraction, any political home and they will join it, but maybe they are not quite ready to sign on to socialist alternatives politics, which is much more prescriptive. Right. So there has to be a home for that too. That is why I was saying that at this moment, it is crucial. We see as Trotskyists, we see our task in building both socialist alternative and worker strike back and the larger labor movement you know, equally seriously. All right, excellent. Steve says, I love this woman. You've got a fan in Steve. Thank you, Steve. Uh, here's a question from Ellen, which uh, I know what your answer is going to be, but she's been asking us about this too, having you know trouble seeing the connection between Cornell and labor. So curious as to Shama's opinion on Cornell West, good or bad for labor? Definitely good for labor. I mean, just you know, it's sort of it's. I think it relates to your question earlier, Keaton, also about you know what what should Cornell West campaign be doing? You know, what's what kind of strategic st suggestions would we have? Uh, one of the suggestions I already said, it, and it, but it connects to Ellen's question, which is that we need the Cornell West campaign to build a really big profile inside the labor movement, you know, on labor issues. Literally, he, he needs to go to the picket line, you know, go to Hollywood in the writer's picket line, go uh, to talk to talk to Teamsters at their pr practice picket. You know, UAW will be go, doing pickets, I'm sure, soon. So, you know, really having your finger on the pulse in the labor movement is going to be crucial. But here's how it connects to labor. What have we seen from big sections of the labor leadership? We have seen the AFL-CIO itself. You know, this is the nationwide labor organization. It's head, Liz Schuller, glowingly endorsing the Biden candidacy. You saw big unions, my union leadership, AFT. We never, the rank and file of AFT was, never got asked about it, but the le union leadership went and endorsed Biden. I read a statement from the IBEW, you know, electrical workers leadership, craven, craven statement on Biden, but the rank and file have no say in it. So uh, right. you've seen big sections of labor leadership endorsing the Biden uh, um, candidacy for president. And some of the better leaders on the, you know, somewhat of the, on the left are staying silent, you know, so that itself is somewhat of a betrayal. You know, it's not as bad as, you know, openly championing Biden, but it's still not far from good enough. So in this context, having a genuine left alternative campaign that we can bring the disenchanted rank and file union members around and pose a real challenge to the labor leadership the labor bureaucrats who have endorsed Biden, that is a very, very crucial because without, without that, it's it's difficult to have that debate inside labor. And it's very, very important. I mean, the whole project of building a mass party uh, for the working class is it cannot be done without having a real fight inside the labor movement itself. So we need this debate to be generated inside labor. It's not for no reason that we emphasize labor so much. And I think uh, Cornell West, just to emphasize, needs to be out there. I'll just uh, say one interesting thing, tidbit that I remember. In 2013, when we were running for city council, the local 
lefty publication, The Stranger, they wrote an article. Again, again, I want to be clear, this is in no way uh, any kind of self-praise, but I'm just explaining what we need from the Cornell West campaign. The Stranger wrote an article, something along the lines of, how does Shama Sawant manage to be everywhere at all times? And that was that, that article was about how our campaign was, and I personally was everywhere. You know, if the taxi drivers are doing a driving caravan protest outside City Hall, if uh, you know, SEIU workers or members are having a protest action against poverty somewhere else the same day. I was there everywhere. And that's what that's the kind that's what it looks like concretely to be fighting on the left. You've got to be there. You've got to show up and you've got to show up with uh, you've got to be armed with very strong political analysis as well. It's not only about showing up. It's also about understanding what you're fighting for. It's about understanding when Anderson Cooper uh, brings up the completely shameful point about Iraq war, you eviscerate him, you know? So yes. understanding all of that is part of the, you know, part of the thing that you need to do. Well, and you're, you're not even winning them away from Biden. You're winning them away from Trump. I mean, the leadership is so alienated from the I membership. Know, it's so, it's They're not so, even voting that way. No, it's, 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 you're, you're exactly right, Russell. And if, if, if I might just uh, quickly, you know, in, um, in 2021, you know, when we were fighting against the recall attack, I'm sure you'll remember the Pacific Northwest Carpenters, you know, whatever regional council, the members organized with that union, they went on strike. It was a rank and file led strike. Uh, and they went on strike. I don't know if you remember, after having voted down four tentative agreements that were being foisted upon them right. by their leadership, really rotten leadership that was later than forced to resign after the fact. Uh, and at that time, uh, we were the only ones, you know, my office, Socialist Alternative, our campaign, of course, at that time, we didn't have workers strike back, but our campaign against the recall, we were fighting alongside the carpenters. And the starting point was when, you know, when um, uh, Lo Logan Swan, one of our members of Socialist Alternative, he's an iron worker, union iron worker, but he's a socialist, he's known as a socialist, uh, went to one of the first carpenter rallies. And these are courageous rank and file, keep in mind, they are tired of their union leadership, they're going on strike. Um, and one of their members, who's a two-time Trump voter, ex-Marine, two-time Trump voter, he said, hey, call me, I don't want you here, or something like that. And then it went from there to him, the same ex-Marine, two-time Trump voter, shaking my hand at the press conference a few weeks later, recognizing that socialists are the only people, you know, socialist alternative is the only people who stood with us. We've been abandoned by our leadership. We've been abandoned by the Democrats. And if you're standing with us, then we are here fighting together. And so that really shows you how you can win over Trump voters. I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to romanticize it. You know, there's a real current of reactionary thinking that we have to fight against. We're not gonna, we're not gonna do this on the basis of cutting corners on the issues of oppression, misogyny and sexism and, and trans rights, but we're gonna win them over to our politics by being the best fighters for their working class needs. Right. Uh, <clears throat> pardon me. Bebel asks, uh, is Wes reaching out to you to coordinate his labor outreach? What is your involvement there? I've definitely, I mean, I've had a meeting with them where this was one of the specific things I uh, offered. You know, I've said that, you know, this is something that we can specifically help the campaign with. I know Jill Stein, Chris Hedges are very excited about it. I, I think the campaign is, uh, you know, so, sort of still evolving. The campaign team is still evolving. So we're waiting to hear back. But it's certainly the, something that we are, we are chomping at the bit to help them with. Beautiful. Caleb, uh, thanks for the donation, says, Shama, thanks for being such a pistol. I don't imagine you're fearless, but you act like it, and that's all the more impressive. Digital hat off. Well, thank you for the kind words there. Ryan Wagner, interesting question. I hope I'm uh, saying this right. Does Shama know about the Pani Foundation or the Pani Foundation in India and, and the work that they do? If so, what are your thoughts on their work with impoverished uh, communities, and how can we create similar projects? I, I don't specifically know the Pani. Pa, Pani means water in Hindi, so I assume that's what it is about. Um, there's, you know, the whole sections of the population that don't, don't have access to regular and clean water. And so I assume it's something like that. Uh, and I'll, I'll certainly look them up. I think it is crucial. I'm, I'm glad this question came up because I think it, it points towards how there are many nonprofit organizations uh, in the United States, in India, in Egypt, on every country who are doing really 
uh, who are carrying out a valiant effort but it's unfortunately not the way to go what we have to do is of course we support uh, the the work that many of these genuine people are doing but what we offer is not just sort of you know helping them in their nonprofit work which of course we should do when we can but really what we need is a mass political fight back because if you look at how uh the you know the genesis of you know the the emergence of the nonprofit um as what many call nonprofit industrial complex or nonprofit industry so to say it really is related to how the the you know the agenda under capitalism completely abandons obviously the working class but much more dramatically you know vast swaths of poor and marginalized people and we're talking about the neo colonial world so it's huge the needs are huge and the only way we can actually win victories to lift these tens of millions of people from abject situations is to build a mass fight back so um you know i was just looking up about pani it is it is it sounds like a very good effort which is active in the area of drought prevention and watershed management this is what i thought and this actually in the in maharashtra which is the state i grew up in and uh so it's important work but as i said uh all of this work has to be really tied to a political struggle sometimes people come into the nonprofit mindset uh, and i'm and this is in no way in in reference to the viewer who asked this question i want to be clear i'm just speaking in general uh they arrive at nonprofit genuine people arrive at nonprofit because they are somehow uh, it's intimidating to be in political struggle or it feels like it's never going to happen and so you just want to do something in the here and now which is an understandable impulse my only point is that it's simply not going to solve the problem so i'll tell you a counter example the the kind of thing that can shift things in india is the farmers movement you know i'm sure there were a lot of non profits working with small small and medium farmers for decades but what is it that defeated modi's attempt to corporatize agriculture in 2020 and 2021 it was a mass movement of farmers that lasted a whole year which ended up being joined by the rank and file of the labor movement in india which forced the labor leadership the trade trade union leadership to then call a one day general strike in solidarity with the farmers we built international solidarity we passed a resolution on the city council in in solidarity with the farmers as well and it was that kind of fighting mass fighting approach that forced modi to back down on all of the three you know the three demands that the uh, workers had so that's the kind of fight back we need everywhere in the world and you know again in in closer to home if instead of fighting for and winning the 15 dollar minimum wage we had talked to corporations about providing a little help for low wage workers then that would have been a real mistake and i and i bring that example not in the abstract that is the approach that was being used by much of the labor leadership at that time they were using 15 dollars an hour as simply sort of a threat to get smaller concessions we thought why why would we do that there's energy to fight around 15 so let's actually win this freaking thing excellent um Let's move on here, Mario. Shama's the truth. Thank you, Mario. Appreciate that very, very much. Thanks for the donation, Mr. Fancy Pants. Says great show. Shama's the best. Another fan of Mr. Fancy Pants. Thank you, Mr. Fancy Pants. Appreciate that. Uh, here's a question, Shama. Uh, I have not heard you speak to this much. I'm interested if you'd like to uh, talk about this a little bit. I'd like to ask Shama what caste she comes from and what her family's uh, specific experiences are. Yeah, I come from. what's called the brahmin caste my family is uh, from the brahmin caste which is the most dominant caste in india and so my experience of it was not that i was on the receiving end of caste oppression but i saw it with my own eyes at very very close quarters uh, what what it does what, what a what a dehumanizing and dignity robbing thing it is to have the caste system it's it's like you know it's like any other form of oppression it's it's like misogyny racism that's how it plays out it dehumanizes and robs the dignity of a section of humanity a section of the working class and so my my some of my earliest memories are about you know are are sort of seeing that play out in front of my own eyes um uh, but it was not separate from 
the issues of class itself. You know, you can see that ultimately, if we just rely on looking at only caste or only gender oppression and so on, it really leaves you without an understanding of why these things come about. And so one of the things that I should share with your viewers who may not be familiar with this is that the caste, um, the caste system itself, you know, it, it, it dates back more than 2000 years and at, it, it was it was put in place by the ruling classes at that time. I mean, you know, it predates feudal era even, but it does not predate class society. It's very much a product of class society is the whole point. And it ended up subjugating um, the vast majority of the people in India, for example, uh, to be to be uh, truthful, uh, to to various degrees of oppression. And the oppression was the worst and still continues to be the worst. The people who are the lowest and also people who are outside of the caste system, you know, forest dwellers, the um, indigenous communities and so on. Uh, but uh, the only way you can understand why this system is being perpetuated in this day and age is to understand the class aspect of it. You know, even though it is seems something completely anachronistic, it it exists today because capitalism fosters every kind of oppression because it helps the system maintain itself. And that's why the fight against caste oppression cannot be separated from the fight against capitalism. All right. Our next question, a big, big donation from Martin R. Thank you so much, my friend. We appreciate that. Thank you, Shama, for your work. And kudos to DD for bringing this incredible woman to show us the way. Well, thank you for the kind words, thank my friend. You, we appreciate that very, very much. And thank you for the donation. Um, Bennett Weiss, this is my father, Shama, asks, should there be a limit on individual net worth? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, not a surprising answer. That, that, was, a, that was an easy one. That was a softball, a lob ball, <laughs> right, yeah. down, yes. right down the middle. Um, this is an interesting one. Uh, I'm not sure I totally understand the context, but we'll see if you do, Shama. How would you recommend reporting activist targeting and surveillance in Capitol Hill? I was obstructed in past attempts to make reports. You're talking about infiltration and crackdowns on activist movements. Is that what you're talking about? I assume. Yeah, it seems like that's what uh, they're talking about. I mean, if there are specific instances that have happened, I'm assuming it's somebody who lives in Capitol Hill, if Tower Spire has met been met with a deaf ear maybe from the mayor feel free to message my office and if there are specific things that are happening you know we will of course look into it uh not, I mean, our, our office is not like other offices so yeah we're, we're uh so feel free to get in touch with us uh okay um rodrigo there you are thanks rodrigo What's Shama's take on all the Twitter beefs between YouTube streamers? Are we better off staying off stream? Well, she's gonna be in this business soon. You're gonna be in the you're gonna be in the game soon. A month and five days. People are gonna be clipping your streams. <laughs> oh yeah. Shama says Coke better than Pepsi. Right. Twitter exactly. erupts. Yeah. Uh, 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 what? Which specific Twitter beefs are they? <laughs> you, don't have to, you don't have to get. I mean, there's so many. That. I just thought it'd be funny to bring up now that you're going to be in the YouTube game yourself. Yeah. But it's interesting because you you did mention this earlier about how you know it's not the same thing. Um, like when I go into a UPS warehouse or when we go to work in a workplace, um, you know that's not as hostile to us as when you went to work at the city council. I was about to say now that you're going to be a YouTuber, you're going to be dealing with hostile management. You know, YouTube YouTube keeps a close eye on all these kinds of channels oh yeah so yeah that's how we I mean, feel when we do a live stream like we're not really wanted here <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly and i and i fully expect that i fully expect all the institutions of the state to keep tabs i mean i'm sure they're doing that uh you know the whole they've been doing that the whole time i have no illusions but I, but in terms of the last question that was there you know should we be getting off twitter i think we're to approach this again from a political standpoint which is that if there is a big section of the political audience on Twitter, then no, we should not be getting off. You know, we should we should be fighting to be to be having to continue to have access to it because it's not so, we're not trying to convince the the institutions of the U.S. state to be on our side. We know they're going to be hostile to us, but we're trying to reach the masses, the millions, the hundreds of thousands who are going to be listening to us and who can be activated to be in struggle. All righty. Well, I believe that is everything we got for you, Shama. It was a real pleasure. Thank on, you so I have much. One question. Oh, sure. Have you seen Triple R? 
<laughs> oh, the Bollywood movie? Yeah. It's you know, Tollywood, actually. It's Tollywood. Yeah, it's Tollywood. It's Tollywood. It's a Telugu movie. Uh, and it they the song, the famous song, it did it won I, an Oscar for something, song. right? Yeah. Best dance. Yeah, it won an Oscar, like, I think. Yeah. Nacho. I, Nacho. I've uh, yeah, I've watched that song, but I have not watched the movie. My my tolerance for uh, that type of masala movie is very, very, very low. Uh, uh, see, uh, Russell asked I, me to watch I, I do, it so we can I, review I it, and I told the the excuse I gave Russell is that it's too long; it's three hours. I don't have. Yes, three hours no, no, to that's not an excuse. Anymore. That is a genuine thing because <laughs> if it's three hours long, then it better be worth your time. It's definitely not. I do watch um, Indian movies, but it not that type. It was it was very very entertaining for me personally there there yeah. was a very there's a reviewer critical drinker that was actually what made me watch it he did a really interesting review of it and and he was right it's it's a whole different vocabulary of how you express emotion and drama than we're used to but yes. it does but it does translate i mean it translated for me not not yeah. for you ironically <laughs> yeah it's it's weird i mean I, I i do it's not that i don't watch these type of mas I, I don't know if your viewers know when i say masala movies i mean like that kind of you know the, the, the like kind of the movies. action kind of yeah yeah it's like it's like it, it has everything romance action right. music yeah, yeah, yeah. whatever it's supposed to be like a crowd pleaser family entertainer and there's a there's a and i'm not i'm not um uh you know it's, i'm not it's not like i'm above those things in the sense that there's a whole host of um, working class Indians who watch these because that's the only uh, access to entertainment that they have. So in that sense, there's a it's a real thing. You know, these movies are they are watched by millions of people. I mean, we're talking about India. right? Everything is on a giant scale. It's like more than a billion right, people right, 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 right. Uh, population. So uh, a lot of just ordinary people watch these movies. And it's a huge money-making industry. You know, mo right, movie right. making is a huge industry. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, in that sense, a lot of people watch them. That that one you might find kind of interesting because it's this. It's set during the Raj. Yes. And and the British are just these Bond villains, basically. They're just the, <laughs> these horrible, horrible, just absolute villains. No redeeming qualities whatsoever. And, uh, you know, it's just all about their kind of uprising against them. As, as an American, I found that aspect fascinating. Oh, I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure it is. Yeah. Okay. I found a couple more questions over on Rockfin, actually. Sorry. So if, if, if you have a few more minutes, um, course, I'll just yeah. ask a couple more. No um, you, a Rem asks, and I can't put these up on the screen because I can't copy and paste, but A Rem asks regarding RFK Jr. running within the Democratic Party. First, the claim that the Democratic Party has the right, even the Democratic primary elections, regardless of voter. Uh, sorry, I'm just trying to ask. What do you think of using agency within the Democratic Party to propel RFK Jr. early in the primaries? I th I'm assuming you're not big on RFK Jr. No, no, okay. absolutely not. Although uh, it, it is it is a it is the reality that the Democrats, the Democratic establishment is so worried about competition that they are refusing to do any kind of primary debate itself so that's 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 actually the it's it's like uh, one of the best current arguments for why Cornell West should not should be running independent like it, it's asinine when people say well you know you should be running as a democrat like what does that even mean they're not even going to do debates why should he be running as a democrat I mean you know it's just it's just completely ridiculous to have that notion and so the Democratic Party is further making the case for why we should have independent campaigns, but not like RFK, obviously not. All right. And I got one more from Roger Meadows over here asking, what, will you use workers strike back to get more states, including New York uh, and your own, to become citizen ballot initiative states for amendments and not law? But also, will you use workers strike back to get socialist policies on the ballot by pushing citizen initiative amendments in the states that can already do it themselves? So like a direct democracy approach, I, I would assume. I mean, again, it's, it's similar to the... Um thing we were discussing earlier, which is uh, obviously all those are good in, uh, progressive initiatives, uh, you know, uh, um, agendas, but whether or not we pick one of those things as a demand to fight around, it will depend on whether or not it has momentum around it. And so um, 
ultimately it won't be a question of what, what's my pet project or what socialist alternatives or what, what worker strike backs preoccupation it'll be it'll be what 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 do what are people willing to fight around it'll be the issues that are the most dominant at that moment uh, and then i'll also say that typically the most momentum i think will be that will be generated will not be around um um electoral law you know because that's a bit esoteric it will be around more clear demands like you know medicare for all $25 an hour it's very clear that this immediately relates to your standard of living your your quality of life those are much clearer in terms of building a mass support around it's not going to be so much those kinds of things and also i would also say that you know of course we we would we would absolutely fight around any kind of ballot initiative effort if if the if we see potential in it but we also should not have rose tinted glasses around the idea like over oh, that's direct democracy uh, as opposed to elected officials it doesn't work that way because it's the same system it's the same goddamn system and it's the same goddamn democrats and republicans you're fighting against so this idea that oh the democratic party might fight against uh, your uh, election campaigns you know like a candidate election campaigns but they'll leave your initiative campaigns alone that's 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 not true they will come uh, after every progressive initiative and that's the track record of the democratic party they try their level best to defeat it when they can't defeat it then they try to co-opt it and they try to claim that they are the ones who did it uh, but uh, they are never going to leave anything alone it, it also relates to actually this question relates to the question the perennial question on the left that keeps coming up which is local versus national oh you know shouldn't we run local and a lot of people again i find this a really just asinine position they say well you know the reason shama and socialist alternative were able to do this in seattle is because it's local are you kidding me have you seen the kind of opposition we have faced by the democratic establishment like they have fought us tooth and nail they have used every every trick they could come up with including you know when we were fighting for the amazon tax in 2020 remember in 2020 it was blm but it was also covid everything was shut down they literally said in this was progressive latina democrats lorena gonzalez and teresa mosqueda progressive labor latina democrats women who who refused to let me actually have a committee meeting over zoom or in person uh, on the amazon tax legislation from my office in the name of oh we need to keep our staff you know we cannot burden our staff with extra meetings like literally something like this they used against us in their attempt to completely shut down the tax amazon movement and when they couldn't then they go around pretending like they they were the ones who allowed it to happen so so there's no there's no universe you know there's no corner of this country that you can go and say okay let's in this little corner we're going to make good things happen and we won't face opposition no it, there is no such thing there is no avenue for progress without having a political clash with the ruling class um okay excellent we just have a couple more things this guy is is annoyed that i i edited out your point on the rfk question the so all right because you gave us uh a a tip here i'll just read this word for word okay so regarding rfk jr rfk jr running within the democratic party first the claim that the d party has the right even after d party primary elections regardless of voter will semicolon a d party claims the right to choose the d party general election presidential candidate that is a claim what do you think of using agency within the d party to propel rfk jr early in the primaries I assume that's the same question we got before in terms of heightening the contradictions and exposing that they're anti-democratic. I'm assuming that's what the question is. I think the answer is the same, no? Yeah, I mean, obviously we are against all the uh, um, anti-democratic and shady attempts by the democratic establishment to shut down any candidacy outside of Biden's. Obviously, that's, that's very clear, uh, but... Uh, I don't think that we can, the left can be in the business of in any way uh, of um, uh, trying to propel RFK's campaign forward. Like, please, no, we should be fighting for the Cornell West campaign. Yeah, 
Um, just two more questions. I'm, I'm sorry, Shama, but Roger also yeah. asked on Rockfin about your position on worker co-ops and, uh, and things like that um, as a way to sort of, I guess, transcend differences between union and non-union workers. Worker co-ops are um, very important. So in the sense that, you know, they offer to some degree, offer a glimpse of what is possible in a society that is uh, genuinely, you know, dem uh, a society in which the resources and the wealth uh, are um, controlled and organized by the majority of the working class to, for the good of humanity, for the good of society. But uh, uh, again, it's, it's it's similar to my response on the nonprofits question in the sense that yes, that's true, but at the same time, in in the context of capitalism, there is no such thing where some co-ops will be left alone and then, you know, good things can happen there. And also, there are limitations to this as well. I mean, just to give you a concrete example, there's a chain of co-op grocery stores called PCC, PCC Community uh, Stores, um, something like that. You know, so it, it started with this kind of, you know, co-op, worker-owned kind of community-owned kind of thing and, you know, organic grocery store. And... Um, today, the workforce in PCC is organized with the uh, UFCW 3000 union local, and it's a nonprofit in the sense that they are not, you know, they're not like Amazon, but at the same time, what do we see? We see the CEO, you know, Krishnan Srinivasan, who makes more than $500,000 per year, and uh, they are just as... Uh, just as opposed to the workers' basic demands as any other for-profit corporation would be, you know, like they the the um, shifts are terribly understaffed. They the owners, you know, the PCC, sorry, not owners, but the executives, the bosses spoke out against the pandemic hazard pay that the workers did end end up winning. And right now, you know, the workers are the UFCW members are fighting for their new contract and. They're facing the same situation, you know, where they are, you know, they're they are demanding $25 an hour starting wage for all workers, $35 an hour for workers with, you know, three years seniority. They are, they are demanding an end to understaffing, an end to the divide and conquer between immigrant and non-immigrant workers because there's a real policy of discrimination against immigrant workers. So it's really good that they're raising that as a demand as well. But my point being that all this is necessary because the co-op management is not approaching this in sort of in the idealized way that we would imagine that, oh, it's a co-op, so they care about their workers' needs. No, they don't. And so the workers are having to fight back. And, and I'll just mention also that the the unfortunately, the union leadership is all, has also fallen short. And actually, the fight back is being led by a rank and file caucus called PCC Workers United. And so all this is happening in the context of a co-op. All righty. Ram on Rockfin says, love to Shama through DD. Thank you, Ram. We appreciate that. You, um, I'll talk to you more about the Rockfin stuff uh, in a couple of minutes. Uh, Pete Sweet, thanks for the donation. Thanks, Shama. Do you have any relationship with the new UAW president, Sean Fain? What do you think of him? Uh, I, I don't have any relationship with him personally. Obviously, I'm following what's happening in the UAW. And in fact, UAW is an example of where um, much more problematic leadership was overthrown under the pressure of rank and file anger. So that's really crucial. But again, uh, it can't stop there. Clearly, the rank and file militancy and organizing and democracy inside the union needs to keep growing. All right. Wonderful. Russell, I think that's all of our Super Chat questions for Sham. I know we have some more that we so. can take, but I think yeah. that's all the questions for Shama. So Shama, listen, uh, it was a great, great pleasure having you here. Thank you for being so thoughtful and so thorough in your answers, not only to our questions, but to our audience's questions. Thank you for giving us uh, so much time this evening. Yes, and thank um, you very much, Shama. Yeah, it was really fantastic. So it was it was great to see you. And um, do you want to just uh, give one more plug to your upcoming uh, YouTube project on strike? Yes, it is uh, September 14th at uh, 6 p.m. Pacific time. So it's 3 p.m. Eastern time. Please tune in. We're well, going be to 9 p.m. Eastern time, right? Sorry, 9 p.m. Right, 9 right. Yeah, we're three hours. <laughs> the opposite. <laughs> three hours later, it's okay. Uh, yeah, 9 p.m., sorry. 9 p.m. Uh, Eastern time. 
uh, yes, it's very important that people tune in. As I said, it's the launch of our video broadcast on strike. And I should say, I mean, we're really excited about this and we, we want to, uh, you know, we want on strike to, uh, be the sort of the vehicle for the analysis that we have brought forward through our campaign. And we want to be working alongside the left, um, you know, news sources like yours, uh, like RBN and so on, you know, so we're really excited to, to do that. And uh, also to clarify, it's it's not just a video broadcast, it's obviously tied to the work of Workers Strike Back as well. So, you know, On Strike is a is a project of Workers Strike Back. So hopefully people will tune in, but you will hear me saying and hear my co-host saying that, you know, be a, saying that we, we don't want people to just watch this. We want people to get into action and that's where Workers Strike Back comes in. So if people are interested, please check out workersstrikeback.org, all one word, Workers Strike Back. And um, yeah, please, please send us an email. All righty, Shama. Thank you so much. It was great to see you again. We'll be in touch for sure. Thank you so much, Keith and Russell. Really appreciate it. Take care. Thank you very much, Shama. Bye. -bye. Bye. Shama Suwant, everybody. That was a great interview. Oh, yeah. That was great. I mean, that she was, was awesome. Yeah. Yep. She was awesome. Spitting um, fire. Spitting fire. Spitting truth. And um, and and we were texting a little bit Friday. Keaton's going to take the day off. Me and Shama are going to cover Triple R. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah, Film Club Revival. Yeah, Film Club special Revival. Special edition. Um, so, folks, what we're going to get going on the next show, I meant to get it going tonight, but we were dealing with rumble technical difficulties during the countdown. Um, so I just forgot to do this. But um, we'll get Jake set up with, with the Rockfin so that uh, Jake can post some of the Rockfin questions in the back end of our site i meant to do that this evening I'm, i apologize about that it was just rumble crapped out on us so i was trying to figure that out when i should have been working the rockfin out but moving forward we will do that so thank you guys for watching over on rockfin you are not taken for granted uh i apologize if you were given that impression um patrick donahue thanks for the 20 bucks Happy belated birthday to russell hope you had a good one keep fighting the good fight love your insights thank you very much patrick thank you beautiful uh, uh people who knew me in real life felt that way <laughs> right, exactly <laughs> i you know we owe like two singing bowls we do like, owe two we singing bowls we, we, we just thought shama we would think it's sure shama. yeah <laughs> or, or or you know appropriation <laughs> right, exactly <yeah. laughs> she, she actually had a good sense of humor she, I'm sure she would have, uh, I mean, she, it just would have been weird. We the context would have been very weird. All yeah, of a sudden, exactly. you just break out a singing bowl. And, and the boom. workers really need to unite. Yeah, but, yeah right, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just keep slamming it throughout the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> Abiding 71, thanks for the 99 cents. We appreciate that very, very much. Caleb Tatro, all class folk ain't kin folk. Yes, 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 yes. That was an addendum to sure, your question, sure. but thank you very much. Sure, sure. Mr. Methuselah, the DSA gets its direction from the DNC. It's in its charter, hence the D in DSA. Clown, clown, clown. Yeah, Shahid Buttar, when we interviewed him, uh, it's got to be almost a year ago by this time, he called them the dramatic socialites of America. I thought that was a good name. <laughs> <laughs> How did how did he not win with that kind of way? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I, that was really like the moment that because you know I mean uh, you know I've, I've followed Shama a lot, so not that I heard her talk on a lot of the things that we've asked her about. We tried to ask new questions, but I know her work well enough to kind of know where she's going with a lot of the answers. That bit about the DSA telling them not to get involved in the contract fight, like don't tell them to vote no because you're an outsider. I mean, that's just jaw dropping. I mean, it's just fucking amazing. <laughs> it's just amazing. Well, I, I mean, they're deeply unserious. Yeah. As, as Nick might you say. Talk about, it. I mean, like, and like I said, I know some people in the chat said there Keaton goes again. You know, that was the moment where I almost, I almost went off, not on Shama, but on them. I said, they're outsiders. DSA is, you got a lot of fucking rich kids in DSA. How many, how many people in DSA worked the wear, worked the night shift at UPS, you know? What are you crazy? I mean, yeah, amazing. yeah. Look, I, I, I always. It's funny, man. I mean, just like Trump broke a lot of people's brains, COVID broke a lot of people's brains, man. Whenever I post 
something like I'm trying to find it now. Um, a lot of you probably saw this. There, there was the uh, the DSA pictures that went circulating, and everybody was masked. Like this was like last week. It was like yeah. last week or two weeks ago. It was like nine out of ten people were still wearing these masks. Yeah, there's a lot of them. Certainly a lot. I I was hoping there'd be more. I mean, we have some stuff now um, from the convention, which I brought up, you know, 704 to 104, you know, against breaking from the Democrats. And so, you know, it's it's a systemic problem there. And I think the root of it is no foreign policy critique. I, I don't see how you could call yourself a socialist organization and have no foreign policy well, I, well, I critique. The- I think the root of it is what we're talking about. I mean, they're like, they're, they're, you know, disaffected shit libs, basically. Like, culturally, they have a lot more in common with the shit libs than they do with workers. So they they have shit lib tendencies, basically. You know, it's, it's like shit libs cosplaying as socialists. Yeah, especially now. Especially now. DC, thanks for the $5. FDR's FBI under Hoover destroyed the labor movement. Unions were infiltrated, radicals were deposed, and the NLRA put forth the illusion of government sympathy. Courtney says, today I was given a message from Buck Angel to tell you both hello, my friends. Well, hello, Oh, Buck. hello, Buck. Glad he remembers us. We had a fun time with Buck on the show. We had a, that was one of my favorite interviews. Yeah, that was a, that lot, was of a lot of fun. <laughs> um, I usually don't respond to the trolls, but I had to. I had to feed this one. I, I, forgive me. You left UPS because you're soft, Keaton. You're soft. You're soft, Keaton. Made full time in six months because I put my ass into my work. Well, congratulations. I've said on the show before. The reason I quit is because I was told that there was a fifty-fifty chance that I would not make book after the holidays because they gave me some excuse where they said, uh, well, the books closed 29 days into your 30 day probation period. And because it was seasonal, they weren't going to let me know until January if I made the union or not. And so the whole point of me working there was to make the union to get the health benefits and everything. It wasn't the wage. I could make double what I was making at UPS, driving people's food around, listening to podcasts. So once they told me, once they started dicking me around, about well we'll see after the holidays whether you're in the union i'm like i'm not going to work for half of what i could make only to be told thanks but get the fuck out after christmas so that is why i no longer work for ups i wanted to work for ups i wanted to join the union and i wanted to be a part of this fight now i would have been <laughs> but uh, anyway that's why it did not work out that's my all, friend but congratulations right. i'm glad it worked out for you it's also his jewish back yeah no actually actually i was in some of the best shape i've been in a long time because of all the exercise i mean that's the great oh, yeah, thing about working sure. for UPS. It keeps you your, pumped it keeps your ass in shape well, oh, well yeah. you know it's also when you do that kind of thing like when i first moved into this building i it, the apartment came with a 40 by 40 backyard but it was filled with all the shit that every person who had ever done work on that building just threw in the backyard cinder blocks concrete fucking glass everything I literally pulled 200 garbage bags of shit out of there because I not only cleaned up the surface, I cleaned up the soil. I dug it. I dug it all up. I sifted it out over a wheelbarrow. When you do real work like that, you don't get gym muscles. You get power. Oh, yeah. You get yeah, strength yeah. by the end of that. Yeah, because you work all different kinds of muscles. Right. That's it. So when it's I, not like when targeted I started, bicep. Right. I'd be pulling these things up with two hands by the time I finished. I would yeah, literally yeah. grab a bag with one hand and throw it. Oh, yeah. No, it puts it gets you in shape. That's for sure. Bruce Carter, this is just a chat that I realized. YouTube uh, channel for More Perfect Union did a video recently on class consciousness at a MAGA rally. Yes, I saw about half of that. I didn't see all of it, but we will definitely, uh, that's definitely be covering that on Friday morning because that was a great video. And I didn't even see the whole thing, but what I saw was great. Yeah, yeah, well, they did the video channel. in East Palestine, Ohio, where they interviewed the MAGA guys and they, you know, were talking a lot of that stuff. It wasn't so much like, it wasn't so much class uh, economic theory as much as like anti-corruption stuff. And so that was a great video that they did. But this also looks great. And we will definitely 100% be covering that on Friday. No All doubt right. about it. Um, Case Study QB, hit the like button. 
Thank you, Case Study QB. We appreciate all the work that you do. Give Thank a nice you. shout out, round of applause to Case Study QB. That video that Shama liked a lot of uh, Morning Joe looking like they were about to cry, <laughs> that was posted by Case Study QB. Without you, we well, wouldn't have had that video. So appreciate all the work. You're a valuable you work, our friend. Absolutely. Absolutely. You make all of our jobs here a whole lot easier. Uh, by the way, folks, you could support this show if you like this show by going to patreon.com front slash do dissidents. That is what keeps the show alive. That is what makes the show sustainable. So if you appreciate what we're doing here uh, and you want to help us out, this is by Sign far up. the best way to do it. Sign up at patreon.com front slash do dissidents. You get your name up in lights here on the stream. You get call in access to all the regularly scheduled shows and you get two uh, Patreon exclusive live streams per month, which we do over on Rumble. So those are the uncensored, unfiltered, gates of hell, do dissidents live streams that are available to Patreon subscribers and paid Substack subscribers. So you can go to patreon.com front slash do dissidents. You can also go to our Substack, do dissidents.substack.com. If you could sign up as a paid member there, that helps a great deal. Even if you cannot sign up as a paid member there, you could sign up as a free member there, and that helps us out a great deal uh, as well because it helps you stay in touch with us. So in case we are doing, say, a Rumble exclusive stream on a night when Rumble decides to work, right? <laughs> uh, we will send out a message, hey, tonight's show, Rumble only, not YouTube so that you all know where to tune in. So it's really, really important um, that you stay in touch with us by signing up uh, at our Substack. Even if you sign up for free, it's just an email list. You will get email notifications uh, when we are about to go live. You also get audio podcast versions uh, of all of these streams. So that's dodissidents.substack.com or patreon.com front slash do dissidents. Thank you Fucking all very much sucks. for your support. Fucking thing sucks. Yeah, no, that really, that really sucks. That really sucks that it that it conked out because we need the fucking shit to work, obviously, over yes. on Rumble. In order for it to be, you know, a, a platform, it, ha it has to be reliable. I mean, we had an interview tonight. Like, the shit can't right. not work. Yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> like, we can't just live exactly. in suspense when it comes showtime. Is the thing going to work? We, and we I are. thought maybe it was something I fucked up on my end. So during the countdown, I went in and I checked. And no, I copied the stream key and the URL. Everything was perfect. And it just did not work for no reason. Except okay. that we had Shama Sawan. Except for we have Shama Sawan. Yeah, that, that's my theory. Platform is owned by Peter Thiel. Yeah, right. Exactly. Exactly. Do Not a Trotskyist man. friendly platform over there, apparently. Not at Free all. speech. Not yeah. At all. yeah. Free yeah, speech, yeah. my ass. My ass. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, they, Will they, S. They, they don't mind the trans segments, but that's about it. Yeah, that. Right. Exactly. That they're fine with. Will S. Thanks for the two bucks. The DNC will unwittingly bring about Trump 2.0. Well, polls are looking that Fuck way. Yeah. Polls are looking that way. Underhill. Thanks for the five dollars. Trump has already won the election. None of this election crap matters, and it doesn't matter who the president is anyway. Much love. Well, thanks, Underhill. <laughs> Appreciate that. That's, a, that's the sunny optimism we like to cultivate in our audience. <laughs> it's just that kind of that kind of sentiment. Much love. Thank we, we, you. We, we have black pilled a nation, Keaton. Right. Yeah. Black pilled a nation. Ruthless criticism. Thanks for the two dollars. Learn to code equals learn to get replaced by AI. Yeah. Indeed. Indeed, that's what it turned into. So now even learning to code won't help. Yeah, you know, you know, I want to get on the show. This guy, uh, Peter Turchin, who's he's that? making a lot of waves right now. Um, his his book was just published. Um, you know, it's one of those cycles of history kind of books. But basically, he's making an argument about um, elite overproduction being a symptom of impending collapse that this this happens towards the end of civilizational cycles where it's it's an it's an interesting perspective basically saying as the money gets sucked away from the broader uh workers and middle class then people who wouldn't have gone to college in the past and we all know these people i mean from older generations where they have these jobs that you automatically think you would go to college for who never went to college like, like my best friend's father, he was a computer analyst for Merrill Lynch. Guy never set foot in a college. He learned it on the job. He learned, he started with mainframe. He was a Marine 
And when he got out, he had a job at a bank with mainframes and he just learned. Today, they would never give you that job if you hadn't gone to college. So basically, Turchin is saying, uh, you know, back when the money was more evenly distributed, people didn't feel a need to go to college. Because why would there, there's money there? What do you need to go to college? There are all these jobs you can get without going to college. And he, he's arguing that once the money gets sucked away, everybody feels like they have to go get professional credentials and you wind up with this elite overproduction. And that elite overproduction in the end winds up creating a discontented middle and upper middle class because even they can't get ahead after a while. And right. that's when there's such mass disaffection with the system that it can't sustain itself and it collapse into revolution basically uh mj anti-imperialist party shama is a trot russia is not imperialist yeah so that wasn't addressed at her but yo know, listen i'm not gonna get involved in the sort of uh you know inter uh, communist uh, fight yeah the... <laughs> it's not for yeah. me to say <laughs> shots fired i almost said that to her when she said we're anti-stalinist i was be like oh shit you started something now. You started something now. But thank you, MJ Anti Imperialist Party. And uh, uh, I, I, I've learned not to get into it with you crazy fuckers. Yeah, what are we going to say? What am I going to say? Not, I'm not getting into it. I have my views. You know what they are. Will you get Grover Fur on? Asked China Shill. Who is that? I don't know who that is. Is Grover, that a joke? Does he mean from the Sesame Street? Grover Fur? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, MJ anti-imperialist. What in the CIA is this guest? Yeah, no, she's she's a Fed. That that's that's yeah, right. She's, yeah, she's working for got the us. Feds. You got us. You got us. You got us. You got us. Nailed. They they they, 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 pro they, 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 <laughs> they promised me my own gas station for doing this show. I mean, usually I try to deny it, you know, when people yeah. accuse us, but yeah. in this case, he he's got us like well, dead to right. Yeah, yeah, I mean, sometimes so on, just, Fed. Yeah, just saying it straight out is the best disguise because they're like. If they were really working for the feds, they wouldn't say it. They wouldn't it. say it. Right, yeah. exactly. They wouldn't say it. It's like, uh, it's like so John Cusack in Gross Point Blank, where they ask what he's been doing since high school. He says, well, I'm a professional hitman. No, <laughs> really. Right. Uh, Roger Meadows gave us the Rockfin alert. Thank you, Roger. You were over there on Rockfin, and I think I got your previous question. You said I skipped some of your Rockfins. There, there was a lot in there man um i i hope i got to both of the questions that you had i tried to just search for the questions because they were they were pretty long and so you know we had a lot of questions to get to but i, I hope i got to the uh question parts uh of your of your I, pieces i, there. I, I think i i did. i I, I, th I think this uh i think this grover fur person is a is a oh he's a stalinist party, i guess all right, yeah, maybe guess, we'll have a debate. I guess, they, I guess they have a show or something. That'll be fun. Yo, I really want to watch that debate between uh, who was it, Shama and uh, who else? Was it her new podcast? Oh no, uh, it was Shama they and Brian. They wrote, they wrote her a campaign book? manager. Hang on, that name is not a joke. Like the is that their real name, Grover Fur? Could be. Do they talk like this? <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> the thing about Stalin. <laughs> <laughs> Like we have that dude on, I'm totally getting a Grover puppet. And I'm yeah, oh, yeah, right. Yeah, that's a good idea. In the middle of the interview. <laughs> that's a good idea. <laughs> Marco Padilla, thanks for the five dollars. PCC Grocers is not a worker co-op, but a consumer co-op. The unionized workers at PCC should use the union to demand they convert it into a worker co-op. All right. Is that uh, where is that? Is that in Seattle? Is that in her uh, neck of the woods? There, I'm assuming I that's probably why you so. asked. I think so. Okay. Uh, oh, thanks for Jake. Got us the information on Grover Fur. Thanks, Jake. Have a how about a round of applause for Jake doing the producer duties. And Jake, remind me, I'll get you set up with the Rockfin stuff for next time. I meant to do that this evening, but we got tealed. And I could say Peter Teal's name because we're not on fucking Rumble. We're not on oh, fucking yeah. Rumble because the fucking Fuck thing you. sucks. Fuck Shit. you. <laughs> exactly. Uh, exactly. I, 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 I hope our plea for teal bucks works out better. Yeah, right. Exactly. We want some of that sweet, sweet teal money. By the way, Jacob B., YouTube member, uh, I realized I forgot to add you to the scroll, so you got your own title for today. Thank you, Jacob B., for signing up as a YouTube member. King for the uh, day. Last show. King for the day. Ruthless criticism. Thanks for the $5. I like this. The only reason I donate $50 or greater to this show is to build a case of cultural appropriation against you. Interesting. 
Interesting. I, I, I mean, I think I think it's pretty well. So you were built. baiting us. You were baiting us. You gave that to us so that we would ring. So we would the ring singing it bell with Shama. With Shama there. So you could have captured her look of horror and shock <laughs> when I pulled out the singing bell. <laughs> I had no idea I was on a show with appropriators. <laughs> if it's, we ever get to interview Cornell, we should do that with him here. See what he thinks. See what he thinks. He probably have a sense of humor about it. I, I get the impression she's she's watched our show enough to get what the vibe is. Yeah, she seems to have watched the show a little bit. She was referencing the show a few times, yeah, um, so which is I cool. Think she, I think she knew what she was getting into. Seems like it. Seems like it. Um. Nicole, thanks for the $10. When you lift 200 plus patients for 17 years, your shoulders and back are screaming every damn day. So are you a nurse, I guess? So that would make sense. Yeah, that's got to be, that's wow. got to do it to you as well. Yep. Yep. Thank you, Nicole. Some well, people don't think about with nurses. I've heard that from nurses. People don't think about that kind of thing. Oh, yeah, I don't think. Yeah. A lot of it, you're contorting yeah. yourself too because right, you're trying to right. lift somebody up. You got a bit, right. you know, a lot of imbalance there. Will S, look at it this way. A Dem win in 2024 means World War Three. Yeah, indeed. One of the things I was going to add when she talked about how, you know, we're ushering in this new Cold War. I was going to say, I wish this Cold War were a little bit colder. <laughs> it doesn't seem all that cold as yeah. of now. It seems pretty hot for a Cold it's War. It's pretty hot. It's getting pretty hot. Um, dare to struggle, dare to win. Mao Zedong, beautiful. We got all the, all the theorists out tonight what a show well you could tell shama was really having a good time because she stuck around a long time and she gave really thorough and thoughtful answers yeah. to the audience questions too i mean she really yeah. gave a lot of time so she, she was she was very generous indeed indeed no she far was fantastic more, far guest. more than we expected yeah no great guest as i knew she would be there was no doubt in my mind which is why this date folks august 9th 2023 I'm sorry, this is, I mentioned this when, when we had her here, but you can't get a more epic lineup for independent left media than Seriously. tonight. You had Jimmy Dore and Marianne Williamson. You had Dude Dissidents and Sean Swan. Which, it see, I, I'm getting the overall review on that seems to be that he eviscerated her. I watched literally the 30 seconds of it. I just turned it on just to see what was up. And he was telling her, like, yeah, you know, on Ukraine, you sound just like a, an MSNBC host, which is garbage. Like, that was the, like, 15 seconds. He, he literally said that to her? Yeah, yeah. He said it's garbage. Did 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 she uh, did she get up and, like, try to attack him, like, with Marcel? Well, she wasn't in the studio. She was... Uh, uh, if she had been, she probably would have <laughs> thrown a Nokia right at his head. Yeah. <laughs> I should have messaged him. I said, put up a plexiglass panel. I, I, I did tell him that. I messaged yeah, him, you before, DM'd him before. before the interview. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So you had Jimmy and Marianne, two dissidents and Shama Sawant. And then I assume maybe they're still going now. Nick Cruz versus Craig Pasta Jardula on Cornell versus RFK. That is an epic lineup. That's an epic lineup. Not only that, but thanks to somebody who tipped us off in the chat earlier. You also had Jordan Sheridan on the Vanguard show today again, again, and they once again, <laughs> again, <laughs> did no not mention. advertise it at all. I did not advertise it at all. I only knew because the guy, uh, I forget who you were, but it, uh, earlier in the day, you posted in this live chat way before the show. Hey, Jordan's on Vanguard again and still no mention. So look at those four. Hey, Jordan hey, Vanguard, uh, Jimmy Marianne, Do Dissident Shama, Pasta vs. Nick. I mean, that's an epic lineup. That's like that's like in football where you have all the conference championship games one after the other. I mean, that's that's come on, you March, can't get better March than Madness. that. Good TV, March Madness, exactly. Without Bud Light. Um, hey, can anyone answer this for me? Did he ask her about the staff stuff? I'm very curious. I haven't been able to get an answer on that. Anyone in the chat who saw it, just tell me. Did he did he actually ask her about that? I'm, yeah, because really Russell tried to message him before, but it's a little I don't late. think he saw that because I didn't find out he was interviewing her until an hour before the show. Yeah. So I sent him some of the info on the staff thing. I sent him the Jen D's article, but I don't think he saw it before the interview happened. And that's an easy story to miss because it hasn't been reported much in this space. That's exactly why I sent it to him. Yeah. I wish I had known sooner that it was everybody's saying no, he didn't. No. Uh, Man. We should have messaged him sooner, but you know, I, who knew? I, I didn't know. I didn't who knew? Know. You know. Um, 
All right, everybody. So I believe that is everything we've got for tonight. We are going to be back here on Friday morning. We'll have a great morning do show for you guys on Friday. Thanks to everybody who came over here from Rumble. We apologize about Rumble. I don't know what the hell happened. That really pissed me off. Uh, because, I mean, this is just, they, it can't happen. Like, if we plan a show, what if that happens on a Patreon show? Where we're only on Rumble. And we turn it on, and it, it no, doesn't work. We'll have to set up backup streams We have or to, something. listen, this is why you have to become a patron, so we can set up our own alternate video platform. Yeah. Our own non-censorship platform. Maybe we should ask Elon for money. Yeah, something like that. Money. Yeah. We yeah. could actually get a Vimeo well, well, through we'll, we'll Patreon. Tell him it's gonna, it, we'll tell him it's going to piss off Zuckerberg. We could maybe get a Vimeo and do it that way. Maybe that's a good backup to have in case the rumble craps out on us because you can live stream through Vimeo. I mean, it's not a great platform because I don't think you have the chat functionality, but at least you can do a show. Like, what yeah. if this happens when we have a show plan? Like, it, well, that really blows. Um, there's probably a last minute right. workaround well, we doing, can figure we're, we're out. Doing, um, we're having, I mentioned, we have uh, Lisa Sellen Davis uh, coming on with one of the producers of No Way Back, the detransition movie. And we're doing one of those switch over to rumbles. Yes, good, good call. So for that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a backup rumble stream that we could switch right to in case the first one conks out. We'll just set up two. I think that's it's, the best. It's uh, Stephanie Wynn is the other guest. She has a YouTube channel, some kind of therapist. If anyone's interested. Beautiful, 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 beautiful. Um, and Rockfin is a good backup. We could just stream to Rockfin as well. That that's a good idea. Somebody posted and, that and in, a, the chat. in a pinch, in a pinch, in a pinch. But we will get that figured out. Um, yeah, somebody whoever wants to set up a Discord, go for it. Set it up. I tried to set up a Discord. I took one look at it and I said, "There is no fucking way in hell I'm going to be able to figure this out." <laughs> so if anybody wants to do it, go we, do it. We we had we actually had a young man who wants to come sound engineer for us at the protest. I took his information. All right. So, uh, I bet he would know how to do that, too. He seems like the type. Yeah, anybody who wants to do it, you have our blessing, right? Uh, you have our blessing. <laughs> this Mr. Mr. Yeah, Rice. I know. If Rumble didn't work. Good. Now you know. Now you pricks know what it feels like to wait two hours backstage, whatever the fuck that means for two hours and then not get on. You did get on. We, we put you on the phone. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Weiss, you know, we were going to show it tonight, but we had Shama. I completed the video from the rally. You have a lot of, uh, you're lot featured of very heavily in that. You got a lot time. of screen time. All righty, everybody. Well, I'm going to uh, go catch up on that Nick Pasta debate because that seems like uh, it will be fun to watch. And so uh, that's what I got on the agenda for the rest of the evening. I hope you guys have a great rest of the night. We will see you all once again on Friday morning. Thank you all very, very much for being here. Thank you again to our guest, Shama Sawant, for uh, a great time this evening. And we will see you all Friday, 9 a.m. Thank you guys so much for being here on a packed night of indie media content. Thank you for choosing to be here with us. We appreciate that very much on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Rockfin, and hopefully next time with Rumble's blessing, Rumble as well. Thank you guys very, very much once again. Great pleasure to be here with all of you tonight. We will see you on Friday morning, 9 a.m. Eastern for some morning dew. Until then, please do be safe and be well. <laughs> There's too much going on here. <laughs> Courage. Please clap.